You're now listening to Sanity at the Movies Listicle Edition. Hey everybody, welcome to Sanity at the Movies. I'm Nathan, your humble and obedient host, cinema aficionado, and other things. We've got Benjamin Zolzer there. Hello, Nathan. Also cinema aficionado. I also am. Also other things. And Ben, why don't you introduce the other person? Tell us his status as an aficionado and indicate that there may be other things about him that are interesting. There are. Pastor Jake Mintzel. He is an aficionado. He is the biggest Star Wars nerd we have. I humbly submit to you. And he's other things that are interesting. He's got a lot of qualities to him. He does. I think you might have offended Nathan there. I no. I'd be surprised, actually, if I offended him with that. Uh, if we're talking, if we're talking legendary universe, maybe. But yeah, <laughs> for for regular uh-huh. universe, for for current Star Wars, Jake is definitely the biggest Star Wars nerd. <laughs> like I said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm happy that that important distinction has been drawn. <laughs> All right, folks. This episode, speaking of important distinctions, we are each going to make ten distinctions today. For a total of 30 distinctions, well, maybe some of our distinctions may overlap. I'm going to guess there's significant overlap. Maybe. (laughs) I'm going to (laughs) guess. Not significant overlap. I'm going to guess there's almost no overlap. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like Nathan has uh, gotten to the bottom of everybody's list here, and there's no surprises for him. Well, I just think we are are all three going to come from such different vantage points. Anyway, let's tell the people what we're doing. All right. We're doing something that's very rare for us. And that we generally don't do, but we decided to do it in this case, which is to recommend some movies, yeah, more or less. So you can shut off your brains. You don't have to make any decision for yourself. You don't have to use any discernment. You can just take our recommendations to the bank. That was all sarcasm, of course. You should still use discernment. There may even still be things in these movies that you need to discern. We do not claim there are not necessarily. But we do think that what we are about to give you constitutes the top 10 from each of us of movies. What did we decide to call this? Movies you wouldn't be ashamed to watch with your kids or the top 10 movies. I had a title for this episode. (laughs) I forget what it was. I don't think you talked to me about it. No, I put it in Slack. Remember? Top 10 movies. It's not top 10 kids movies. I don't know. What would this be called, guys? Top 10 movies you probably won't regret watching with your family. Okay. That's that's the category, right? And we each came up with our own list. And we're going to share and talk about them today. And this actually comes by way of our friend Lyle. He is a good friend of the show. And he lives in Alaska, which is an interesting fact. And he sent us a message. I'll just read a little bit of it. He says... Sanity at the Movies has been a lot of fun for me to listen to. I am a simpleton and a Luddite. I watch a movie and either like it or don't. If it has something obviously objectionable, I know I should not watch it and try to shut it down. I do hope you keep up the good work. Here's my ask. What do y'all think about publishing some type of list of films that you would recommend for, number one, Christians to watch as a family, and number two, Christian couples could watch for fun? The type of list, I don't think you intentionally wrote it with that tone, but I thought it was fun to read it that way. The type of list that would be agreeable to even the stricter wing of the it's basically all garbage and a waste of time crowd when it comes to movies. What's possibly in the canon, he wants to know. And then he says, I know this is a cliche thing for Christians to do. World Magazine has done it. I'm sure lots of other groups have done it. I know it's simplistic and cheesy and blah, blah, blah. But here's why I'm selfishly asking. I live a weird life. I'm off the grid for many weeks of the year with no internet or electricity. But this year, my family is going to come with me to my commercial fishing operation in Bristol Bay for five weeks. Lyle has a very interesting life. Just interjecting to tell people that. We have electricity, but no internet connection during this time. I told my wife that this summer, no screens will be showing motion pictures while at fish camp. As I could tell, we could all benefit from a detox break from it all. However, I might bend the rules if we get a major three-day storm that keeps us pinned indoors. A simpler way of asking this is, you're about to be marooned on an island, and you have a DVD player with solar power to run it. And you can always take a hundred DVDs with you for amusement of your family. Is this the simplest way, Ryan? Is this, this is your simple. So, Mr. 2021, father of Swiss family Robinson, what 100 DVDs do you salvage from a sinking ship under the quarantine flag? 
I realize that in one sense, Sanity of the Movies is doing this along the way, where at the end of most of these, you ask if this movie is a keeper or not, but I'm asking you for a defined list in one place. We love Lyle. We decided to just do it. Little bit kind of thing we don't usually do. But for Lyle, we'll make a list. So we're not going to give him 100 movies that he can watch on an island with his solar-powered DVD player, though. First of all, <laughs> Blu-ray player, please. Or 4K HD, UHD if you can. But, you know, yeah, maybe your solar technology isn't that great. I don't know, Lyle, what's up with this island? But second of all, we're going to give maybe, I'm going to guess it's going to be, here's my prediction. There will be two or three overlaps and we will end with a list of 28. That's my prediction. But how did you get, so we, our task was to come up with a top 10 list of movies that you won't regret watching with your family. I think we probably all approached this wildly differently. Yep. Jake, what was your approach to coming up with this list? I wanted to come up with easy wins that are just fun, enjoyable. Movies that you can put on as a parent and be happy about for the most part and not resent sitting down to watch it with the kids multiple times. The kind of thing that, you know, if the family votes on for one of these movies on movie night, you're going to be like, oh, okay, that's fun. Even if it's, you know, a repeat. So that's kind of like where I went. And I, I made a list off the top of my head. I actually came up with like 30 some movies that I thought more or less fit into that category. And then I tried to narrow it down to 10. And that narrowing down to 10 wasn't maybe necessarily the best movies on the list, but more about variety within that kind of framework so well so i anticipated that that would be the direction you would go and i thought that a i thought jake has seven kids he actually knows exactly what plays with kids in a way that i don't because i have one kid who's four weeks old or three weeks old or whatever she is she doesn't really enjoy any movies right now she did watch a little bit of ken burns hemingway documentary with me but it made her cry or maybe she was Uh just hungry i don't know anyway Jake actually knows what plays with kids. He has real empirical data to back this up. Probably most of the things he's going to recommend, you know, maybe he's watched with kids or has seen and can gauge or just knows his kids and what they might like. So I thought, you know, Jake's going to be able to nail that so well. I just can't even come close. If I try to do the same thing, I'll come up with a very similar list and it won't be only it won't be as accurate or good. So I'm just going to let Jake do that. I'm going to just give into my inner snob. I'm going to come up with the top 10 family movies that your kids should like. Now, will they? I don't know. Probably not. Maybe if you trained them right from an early age, if you brainwash them, maybe I'll try and brainwash, you know, we'll we'll, we'll reconvene in like 20 years. We'll have Theo on the episode and I'll be like, okay, daughter, how many of these do you actually like? And she'll tell us. Maybe she'll say, you don't control me, old man. Those movies suck. I like Mr. Jake's list. That's probably what she'll say. But, you know, I just thought, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to grab some classics, some, some movies that I think every family should like that, that, that would fire a child's imagination if children still had imaginations. So I'm not, it sounds like I'm being snobby towards Jake's list. Jake's list is better. Jake's list is the accurate list, but I thought I'd have some fun with mine. Ben, what was your strategy? (laughs) I I knew you would be a wild card one way or another. (laughs) I mean, I, I, I almost didn't even try to do a top 10. I did in some sense. So, so here's what I did. I thought of all the movies that, that most, that I most liked as a kid maybe weeding out some that are objectionable. Some, I'm still looking at this list. It's not down to 10 yet. I don't even know what to think about this list. (laughs) And then... (laughs) (laughs) But it's all stuff. Okay. It's all all stuff that I I really liked as a kid or that did fire my imagination or that I found later and thought, man, I wish I'd seen that as a kid or I wish I'd had that movie as a kid. And so that's how I approached it. And it makes for some weird stuff. I'm shocked. No, you're you're not shocked, actually, Jake. <laughs> I'm shocked, shocked that Casablanca mm. is on Ben's list. Not true. No, yeah, no, I, 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 that would be funny if Casablanca, Casablanca, by the way, not on my list because I would think that kids would be very uninspired. 
another movie that I that I thought about putting on my list, but then I just decided, you know, I, I don't think kids would kids don't tend to actually love this. Is It's a Wonderful Life. You know, they they like it when Clarence shows up. They like the ending, yeah. but man, there's that movie's actually pretty adult. So, you know, I did try and choose things that i thought would fire that, that i think ben actually pretty accurately described my list as stuff that either fired my imagination when i was a kid or that i saw later in life and thought man i wish i'd had that to fire my imagination mm. when i was a kid it fires my inner kids imagination now and my inner snobs which somehow generally with me equate to the same thing so <laughs> at least i like to think so because i'm so magical and whimsical and wonderful and, and twee all right Jake, or should we make, just for fun, let's make Ben go first. <laughs> let's make Thanks. Ben set the standard. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. I'm making, I'm going to make this up out of this list. All right, here we go. <laughs> That's what you were we told need, like, to do. two weeks to do this. <laughs> yeah, I know. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I still don't know how to think about what this list is really for. So let's, let's say that number 10 is Steamboat Bill Jr., which is a Buster Keaton... <laughs> <laughs> I I never saw any Buster Keaton or any Charlie Chaplin as a kid. But when I finally saw Buster Keaton, I was like, where have you been all my life? Like, this is one of the most fun things I've ever seen. And if I were a kid, I'd like to think I would have liked this and wanted this. I just didn't know it existed. Steamboat Bill Jr. is maybe the most fun and whimsical of the ones I've seen. And it's just, it's really cool slapstick. It's really, it's really weird. It's funny. It, it has that famous scene where the exterior wall of a barn falls on Buster Keaton, but he's right. but the window passes over him and he's fine. Which they just did. They just like figured yes. out a wall yes. and he had to stand in the right place. And if he'd been standing two inches over, he would have just been crushed by the wall. Like, yeah. Yep. Yep. There's like a cyclone that picks him up and spins him around while he's holding onto a weather vane or something. It's all this crazy stuff. So I love that movie. I'm a big Buster Keaton fan, or at least... I'm a Buster Keaton fan. All right. I'm going to leave off the <laughs> the other two Buster Keaton films on this list because maybe that's, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's gratuitous. <laughs> well, Ben, I, I will be owning some silent comedians later in my list. Oh, good. But good. The, uh, um, <clears throat> and higher up the list. <laughs> okay. That, that's fine. I mean, this might belong higher up the list. I'm just starting with something. So honorable mentions would be The General and Sherlock Jr., other Buster Keaton movies yeah, you those, can check out. You just named Ben. <laughs> Me just my monocle. You just named the three most famous Buster Keaton films. <laughs> <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> They're all awesome. Yeah, no, Sherlock Jr., he gets he falls asleep. He's a projectionist mm -hmm. at a movie yep. theater. He falls yep. asleep and then he finds himself in the movie. And as the movie changes, it's a little bit like Duck Amuck, the famous uh, Looney Tunes short where the paintbrush keeps coming down and painting new vignettes for Daffy to have to deal with. So it's really clever and avant garde and fun. Steamboat Bill Jr., he's on a steamboat and slapstick things are ensuing. Yep. The general, he's on a train and it's on a locomotive having a chase. Yeah. And it's it's just a good slapstick action picture. And if you don't know Buster Keaton, he was called the Great Stone Face because he his shtick was crazy stuff would happen to him around him and he would just sort of be cool and mellow and calm and he never asked you to like him like charlie chaplin was famous for being for his bathos and his pathos and all mm -hmm. that stuff but that's what made him likable that, that is what made him likable mm -hmm. is that he 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 has this childlike sort of oh my house is falling down well how about that a certain kind of child like obviously other children would be like ah my house is falling down but yeah Buster Keaton's the best. Not as good as the silent comedian I'm going to talk about later, in my humble opinion, but... Chaplin. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Mm. We'll leave some suspense. I know people... You can you can relax. We'll get there. <laughs> oh, I, I'm very relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what our audience is saying. All right. Jake, would you like to say your number 10? Yeah, my number 10. I already feel bad about this choice, but I, I picked it, so I'm, I'm going with it. It's Superman the movie. Wow. Christopher Reeve. And I... Certainly a movie that fired your imagination as a youngster. Yeah, and that's a big part of it. I just think, hey, you know, he's the superhero of all superheroes, and we should have a superhero movie or two on this list, and there are two. I guess you make an argument that there are three. But, yeah, I don't know. I just think that 
uh, Christopher Reeve Superman is fun, and it was a toss up, kind of a toss up between that and Superman Two. Mm-hmm. But I, I wanted one to make the list. And why do you say you feel bad about that choice? Oh, it's probably the least rewatchable as a parent of anything on this list. And there are lots of other really great movies that I like. As an adult, you'd just, actually like, rather watch the other movies on your list as yeah, opposed to yeah. But I think it's fun for kids and there may be some scandalous stuff in there that I'm not thinking of. The only thing I can think of is that I think there's some jokes revolving around uh, Hackman's girl. Hackman's girl. Yeah. He's got the secretary and she's got cleavage and the yeah. movie's like, Hey, look at her. She's got cleavage. But I don't know. It's the kind of thing that would go under a kid's head. Maybe if they're there <laughs> <laughs> or over a kid's head or something. Maybe. I don't know. Make your own decisions, folks. But what I like about that choice, Jake, is that it's not cynical. Like, kids just have to put up with so much snark and cynicism, and I really hate that even, like, children's cartoons, like, every cartoon that's made these days comes out of the the snarky, cynical, fast-talking Warner Brothers mold, and very few of them come off of the G. Willikers Disney mm-hmm. mold, and I hate that. I hate that everything's cynical, that everything's self-referential, that everything that's made for kids is somehow the child of Shrek. So, yeah. yeah, so this is just like, hey, something fun and sincere and sweet and... The hero's a hero. Ahead the girl's a girl. The villain's a villain. Yeah, it's cheesy and comic. It's got a great soundtrack, you know, so, yeah. It does have that. And kids aren't... If you, get, if you get them at the right age, I don't think that they're literalists when it comes to special effects. Like, I think they're... Until they become like cynical 12 year olds or whatever, they're willing to just say, oh, yeah, he's flying and they don't care as much about the fact that the Christopher Reeve special effects don't really, to my memory, hold up that well at this point. Yeah. And then I think I think part of I almost think that maybe this movie's place on my list be better served if we went one to ten, but I'm glad to go ten to one. But once you like get, you know, past the first four or five. The second half of my top 10 is just like trying to compliment that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So. Well, we'll, we'll yeah. fill that. We'll paint that picture in reverse, <laughs> I guess, which should be interesting. Yeah. Since Steamboat Bill Jr. should probably go higher. <laughs> well, I'm perfectly happy with my number 10 and its placement because I think it is probably the least of anything that I have here, but it's something that really fired my imagination as a kid. And I hope that kids still like these people, these creatures, but maybe they don't. And they're the Muppets. I've got, I can't really decide. It would either be the Muppet movie, the original 70s one with Kermit, where Kermit rides the bicycle, or, or actually the new one the, uh, called The Muppets mm-hmm. with Jason Siegel and all that good stuff. But I love, I love Muppets in general. I remember I had this. This is just pure. This is a nostalgia pick as much as anything. But I do think as far as good, clean family entertainment with, with just uh, – sprinkling of snark and sarcasm but not so much that it becomes overwhelming and cynical the muppets are the best and i love that they're not cgi i love that you can see the little you know toothpicks that are holding up (laughs) arms uh, his arms and you can see the seams quite literally showing and you can see the the magic that's going into it you realize you're looking at a piece of felt but you also realize that somebody's bringing that piece of felt to life and giving it movement and personality and And i remember even as a young kid being intrigued by that i'm a child of sesame street i loved it i grew up with it you know i would get my own little my socks or my puppets or whatever and and do my own puppet shows and just be really intrigued by how somebody could take a piece of felt and turn it into something and i remember getting a big coffee table book from the library of jim henson studios with all these behind the scenes pictures of henson and oz and these people you know holding their puppets up and just being really it's it's one of the things that really got me excited about movie magic actually just in general like there's the scene in the muppet movie where kermit rides a bike and i still as an adult i don't know how they did that i assume it was very simple robotics cables whatever i mean there's there's ways you could solve that problem but i don't know how they did it looks like this puppet guy is just riding a bike and we've lost that and i mean i love i actually love cgi i'm a, i think it's dumb when people complain about it like oh darn we have to put up with photo realism in our special effects how sad of a society we live whatever but there is just something that's fun about that tactile sort of 
you know that somebody had to put a lot of thought into how to make this work. Mm-hmm. And that may actually be a common, I have not, I've not thought about this. I think that might be a common thread across my list for the, for the budding artist or movie lover or that the nerd kid that you have that's like interested in process or intrigued by how they put these things together. I think maybe my list will be a really good list for, for that kid. Cause the Muppets just as you watch them, and you watch them interact act with these old celebrities and you realize sort of that they're celebrities, but you don't know like Dom DeLuise, who's that? Oh, it's the voice of Tigger from American Tale. It, it, there's just something very, oh, I don't know what it is. It's just, it, it fired my imagination as a kid. So I'm going to go with the original Muppet movie just because it's a classic. And uh, the Muppets were also my introduction to breaking the fourth wall, meta humor, like the idea mm-hmm. that in that movie, they're like, we don't know where the bad guy is going to go. Well, we could consult our script. And then they all pull out their scripts and they they turn to the <laughs> man. That was so mind blowing to me as a kid. And I know there's probably people that did it better and did it first. But the Muppets were my introduction to that thing. Uh, like we're in a movie, but we're not taking it too seriously. And we acknowledge we're in a movie. And so I just, yeah, the Muppets are awesome. And my favorite is Fuzzy Bear, if anyone had any doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> the sad failed. Yeah. There you go. I love all the Muppet movies. Probably a lot of people really love Muppet Christmas Carol, and maybe that's actually what I should have put on my list. That's, that one's pretty great. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. That's my number 10. Ben, you're number nine. Well, we're going to go with an, with another Muppet movie, actually. <clears throat> and this is just, again, as a kid, I loved. There were two that I, this was before Muppet Christmas Carol came out. Right. Muppets Take Manhattan and The Great Muppet Caper. Yeah. I loved both of those. those so movies I'm going to say Muppets Take Manhattan. It's a little more obscure now, I think. Right? Mm-hmm. People don't watch that. But it was, as a kid, I loved it. And I feel like, is that the one with the bicycles, actually? That, no. So, in the original Muppet movie, Kermit rides a bicycle. It's just one scene. They topped it in Manhattan by having a group of Muppets all ride bicycles, which is awesome. And then Muppet Caper, of course, has Miss Piggy on a motorcycle. Oh, yes, it does. Bursting through the window and beating up. you asked for adventure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Beating up Charles Grodin, of all people. (laughs) Back in the days when Charles Grodin was a thing. He's pretty funny in that movie. He's great. He's great. Yeah, no, all those Muppet movies rule. (laughs) I feel like thieves are breathing down my neck. (laughs) Thieves aren't breathing down your neck. Charles Grodin, who's the thief, breathes down your neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. Muppet humor. (laughs) Metatextual (laughs) humor at its finest. (laughs) Move over Monty Python. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Well, since we're saying our favorite lines, the Muppet movie has my favorite one-liner, I think, in any movie. Which is, it's very simple, but I love it. It's, and I, it, I think of it all the time. And it's the part where the, the electric light orchestra, whatever, Dr. Teeth's band, whatever they're called, they've painted Fozzie's Studi- Studebaker to be uh, all the psychedelic colors. And Fozzie comes up and says, Ah, I don't know how to thank you. And then Kermit says, I don't know why to thank you. I don't know why to thank you. <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> it occurs to me all the time in my day to day life. That's the key to Kermit the Frog, by the way. He was always a little acerbic. They, they've, they've played him too straight in more mm-hmm. recent Muppet things. Kermit had a bit of an attitude. He classic Henson Kermit mm-hmm. did. So I think once he played Bob Cratchit in Christmas Carol, they just basically cast him that way for the rest of the, the Steve Whitmer year. I like the regular Kermit. So there you go. Good choice, Ben. Thanks, Nathan. That's it. Jake, you're number nine. My number nine is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse because it is colorful and fun, and I think it is the only CGI thing that made my top ten. Nice. Is, do you have a CGI on your... Can we safely say that's the only CGI that's appearing on these lists? No. There's, okay. there's two more. Okay. So I just, again, in rounding out this list, thought I want something really colorful and fun and splashy That is a little bit more meta for a pretty sincere Mm -hmm. list here, but that brings color to to everything. And that that it's just a little bit more take it or leave it fun. It's not going to be you know leave the kids crying or something like that too much. Right. So uh, that's what that's doing on the or the work it's doing on my top ten. I think Spider Man Into the Spider Verse is a movie that I can pop in at any time and just 
enjoy and have fun with as an adult and my kids are going to be happy and everybody's going to be happy that we're watching Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. We're all going to think it's cool and fun. And yay. It's well, an easy win. It, it has a pretty good argument to be one of the top 10 movies of the 2010s, I think. It's just a great film. Yeah. So I don't know how much else I have to say about it. I've been cast somehow as the Into the Spider-Verse hater just because I wanted to interrogate it a little bit more before I decided to just give it a hug, unlike the rest of society, because I support critical thinking. But <laughs> but but Into the Spider-Verse is awesome. It's great. It's probably the best Spider-Man movie. And it's... Yeah, I, I mean, I picked it over Spider-Man 2, which is... In- one of my runner up category, runners up categories. Well, maybe I'm guessing this doesn't appear on anybody's list, but I could see it. Well, anyway, the thing that I would put it most close to is the Lego movie, which is, I think a very fun, hip, sincere, which I also had in runners up. And, and it was like, it really was for this nine spot. It was, it was going to be uh Spider-Man two or the Lego movie for either. And, and, and even when I, uh, like, I've got my runners up here, the Lego movie doesn't come until like 10 or 12 down the line now, but it was one that I considered putting into this nine spot for, right. the, for the same reasons. Well, I think it's easy to be destructive. It's easy to be Shrek. It's either easy to tear something apart, but to sincerely embody something and also deconstruct it. I mean, to, to use kind of highfalutin language, but mm-hmm. I'm sorry, that's just what the Lego movie and... Into the Spider Verse, I think even better. Do yeah. for for kids in a kid friendly way. It de- completely both movies completely deconstruct the superhero's journey, the Campbellian mono myth, all this stuff in a really fun, smart way. But also sincerely embody it in a way that doesn't feel destructive or dismissive or but respectful. But it feels really respectful. Yeah, and I thought that that was important to have something like that. Yeah, be be on on the list. Yeah, the fact is most kids are gonna put up with a lot of Joseph Campbell and style inspired storytelling in their lives. And so to have the right hip deconstruction of it, that also is it's respectful. Not, it's not Shrek. It's not, you know, whatever. it's not just like, it doesn't invite you as a child to be better than the genre and to be better than everyone else. It just says, we love this stuff, but also here's some fun questions we can ask about this stuff, which is the way to do that kind of thing. So yeah, great movie, great animation, awesome film. Highly recommended. Probably has some naughty stuff. Don't really remember. All right. Uh, my number nine is... What is my number nine? Oh, a movie that... I don't know. Has any of you guys ever seen The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad? Oh, yeah. No. Yes. Seventh Voyage of Sinbad is another thing that really in, uh, fired my imagination as a kid. And I think for the right kind of kid, it would fire their imagination. It is a... Wikipedia describes it as a 1958 Technicolor heroic fantasy adventure film, and it is one of the best movies made by Ray Hauer, Harryhausen, the famous claymation animator guy. Surely everyone's seen a clip of his Jason and the Argonauts where Jason's fighting the claymation skeletons. Mm-hmm. Uh, this movie actually is the Muppet movie to that one's Muppets Take Manhattan because it has one skeleton that Sinbad fights. But he also fights like a giant eagle and a dragon and there's just all this really cool animation and he's rescuing a princess from an island and i just think i think this is just probably a lot of entries on my list are just a way to encourage people you can actually find good clean older adventure movies that are exciting they exist and they're worth they're worth seeking out, you know, if, if your kids aren't old enough to process what's bad about something like, say, Raiders of the Lost Ark, there are actually things that will do some of that work out there. There are probably newer, more exciting things like Into the Spider-Verse. But if you just want to see a guy throw a spear into a claymation dragon and you want your nerd, you, you know, your one nerd kid to be like, oh, that's cool, they... Somebody had to animate that and it took them, you know, one little shot and then they would move it a little, you know, that kind of thing. Then Ray How- Harry Housen movies are great. Unfortunately, they were made kind of in the 60s, which means sometimes you'll run into like, this woman is beautiful and not wearing very many clothes, but this one, not this one so much. 
So be careful with Ray Harryhausen, actually. But, you know, be careful with this one, I don't think. We got like a princess in kind of a jasmine y outfit, but it's, I don't know, pretty chaste. Your mileage may vary on that. Okay, Ben, your number eight. All right, we're, we're going into more alt territory if we weren't already, which is a somewhat darker kids animated film that I loved growing up. And, well, it's Secret of Nim. Based on the book Miss Frisbee and the Rats of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, which I loved as a kid. The movie is not a faithful adaptation. It adds like magic. There's no magic in the book. And I want to say it's like more violent than the book, but it's a great kids' movie and it's fun and the animation is awesome. And it has a real feeling of like mystery and danger, which more than more than an your typical Disney film. This is not a Disney movie. It's Don Bluth. Don Bluth has Don Bluth made garbage, like all dogs go to heaven. But he has a certain edge to him that I think does this movie favors because kids like to feel like, whoa, like this is actual danger. And this is really, this is kind of scary. This is almost too much for me, but it's not quite. Like the movie is treating them with respect. So maybe you want your kids to be a little bit older. I don't know when I first saw this, but I think I was pretty young and I think I liked that kind of thing. And that kind of thing might even recur on this list, but it's a secret of Nim. I don't have a Don Bluth on my list, but I certainly thought about it because Five Ol, the American Tale American was Tale, yeah. an iconic movie from my childhood. And Don Bluth, you're right. He's got that edge, which I think eventually does him in because mm-hmm. his 90s output is all stuff like the pebble and the penguin and all dogs go to heaven and things that are just dark and kind of needlessly stupid and needlessly sexual sometimes. And like he's, he ultimately, when he didn't have somebody like a Spielberg reining him in, he, I don't know how much taste Don Bluth really had. You watch that Anastasia. I know a lot of people remember that Anastasia movie fondly, which was his last big hit. It's okay. It's okay. But it's somebody who is trying to do the Disney thing and just lacks the taste and refinement to really do it mm-hmm. properly. I think. Oh yeah, that's fair. Which is, which is often how you feel about Don Bluth sometimes more egregiously, like in all dogs go to heaven, which is just like, what were they thinking? Mm-hmm. Why would anybody want this Man, weird mean spirited movie. movie? But at his best, Bluth was somebody who grew up with Pinocchio and Snow White and stuff like that and said, I want to do that. I want to tap directly into people's ids with this animation stuff. I don't want to do 101 Dalmatians. I don't want to, you know, Disney had fallen into slapstick at that point and Bluth started out as a Disney animator and then he said, I don't want to do that. And I think for that era, Disney kind of took it back with Beauty and the Beast and the Renaissance stuff. But I think for that 80s kind of period, Bluth was the guy that was carrying on the legacy with Nim and with uh, Land Before Time, which taps pretty directly into your id, I think, and An American Tale, which for a movie being so specifically about the Russian Jewish experience, immigrant experience also taps pretty directly into your id. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Good choice. Jake? Number eight. Number eight. Okay, this is, I think, the last sort of all, maybe why is this on this list Mm -hmm. thing? Everything else is just going to be pretty much an inarguable classic. But I went with My Neighbor Totoro because I wanted, again, just like variety, just anime, easy win, different, not heavy, just cute, super cute and fun. And another just... You can pop this in and the kids are going to laugh and enjoy themselves and you'll laugh and think it's cute and be happy that you watched it. You're not going to resent having put this movie in. Yeah. And and that's really it. That's all there is to it. It's just some variety, some interest, something a little light hand but with a lighter touch, Um, something with a different animation style than a Disney or a Bluth or something like that. Yeah. Well, and I would argue, I think, for the discerning parent – it, it maybe it's recency bias because I, I watched it recently, but still, I think it, I think it holds. Yeah, it no, holds, it's it's think, it's it's yeah. pretty great, and it's safer than Spirited Away. Which, Absolutely. Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of Miyazaki movies that are just gonna freak kids out with their non Judeo Christian influenced worldview, but Totoro is a very gentle way to introduce kids to 
some Eastern philosophy stuff. If that's how you choose to use it, you could probably also just ignore that aspect of it. But but it's got that stuff, all this kind of spirit animal stuff and Taoism stuff mm-hmm. in there very gently and non-aggressively, which is, which is nice compared to Spirited Away, for example, or certainly Princess Mononoke. Less, 100% less beheadings than <laughs> Princess Mononoke. <laughs> my number eight is a live action Disney film. There may be more than one of those on my list. This one is a movie that really fired my imagination as a kid, and I've actually never seen it as an adult. So I'm going to blind recommend it here because I think kids like this movie, and I think I would like it if I watched it again. (laughs) Is it the Apple Dumpling Gang? (laughs) No, my friend. It's the Apple Dumpling Gang Returns. (laughs) (laughs) It's Blackbird's Ghost. It's that darn cat. It's one of those crappy 60s. No, it's from 1954. It is 20,000 Leagues under the sea which i remember being really creepy and cool and the squid attacks and i feel like i've seen parts of it but i don't feel like i've ever watched it i've never watched it either i've only seen the squid attack well it is it is disney operating like so he made all that crap like i mean it's some of it's fun but he made all that kind of absent-minded professor and the shaggy da kind of b stuff but there's two movies and one of them may appear on my list later, that Disney really put A-level production effort, that Walt Disney really took the time and patience to invest himself in live action. And I, I, I won't say what the other one is, but I think probably most people can, <laughs> can guess it's like the most famous live action Walt Disney movie from the last hundred years. But Possibly on my list. But yeah, possibly it's one of the overlaps. 20,000 Leagues is the other one, though. It's an A-list cast. It's A-list special effects. It's Disney having all of his technicians do the most state-of-the-art. Dead Knobs Broom 6, of course, what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, brother. That movie doesn't hold up at all. Pretty bad, actually. Didn't even make it through last time. It was I a little boring one. even as a kid, I have to say. Yeah. Like, it was like you, you, you would tolerate it as a kid. and There were some fun scenes, but that was it. Yeah, it's like, oh, my parents turned this on because they thought I'd like it, and I guess it's better than not watching TV. That's right. Can we get to the place where they recycle the Robin Hood characters? Yeah, no, that's great. Oh, I forgot about that. For like, like a, a boom fo- boo or something like football that? Football game or something. Uh, yeah. yeah. Soccer. Uh, Soccer, yeah, that's what uh. it is. No, 20,000 Leagues, it's got James Mason as Nemo. It's got Kirk Douglas as the strapping hero. He sings that song about a whale of a tail. And yeah, it's great. It's really creepy and cool. And it's a it's a pretty great. I don't know how faithful it is to Jules Verne because I hate reading Jules Verne. I think he's boring. But it's a good, it's a, insofar as being an entertaining movie, it's a, entertaining a level movie and i just remember being really intrigued by it as a kid like all the underwater otherworldliness of it was a lot of fun so you know I'm, I'm kind of i think with my list assuming that a i'm assuming i assume jake would have some of these things but i'm also just assuming you've probably seen walt disney's beauty and the beast like i don't have to put that on my list so if you want to go one deeper beyond that I think 20,000 Leagues would be a great place to start. This is Walt Disney and his all his money and all his people at the peak of their powers doing a live action adventure movie. And um, highly recommended. I think it's on Disney+. Plus. You're making me want to watch it. I think you should. I think you'd enjoy it. It's got a great iconic battle against a giant squid, which I think still holds up pretty well. It's, it's not the Kraken from the Jack Sparrow movies level, but it's pretty cool. Okay, Ben, you're number seven. All right, this is, I don't know how old this is, actually. Not, I'm not clear what the status of this movie is. It's very recent, within the past six years. And I don't really know where I, where I want to put this in the numbering. But Number seven, it sounds like. It is number seven. Where should it be? Wreck-It Ralph. I love Wreck-It Ralph. It is probably my favorite CG Kids movie, actually. Even though there's another CG Kids movie that's higher on the list, I love this movie. I could just watch it when it comes on. It makes me cry. I, th- I think the humor is great. The storytelling is great. Some of the clearest, best job. It's not Pixar. It is Disney, which is weird because that doesn't usually work as well. It's but, one of my runners up. Yeah. But man, is it funny and sweet. But I have 20 runners up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we might have you list them off at the end so we can, so people can have some more suggestions. But and it, it's, what's, what's weird about this one to me is that, and, and it has like, it has like, 80s and 90s video game jokes in it, which, I mean, I'm a kid of the 80s and 90s. So, but what's weird about this one is the messaging is don't dream to be something that you're not because you can't and you're going to fail and you're going to like 
ruin the ruin everyone's lives in your own. Just be what you were made to be and stop being discontented. <laughs> so anyway, that's not the usual Disney messaging and it doesn't really play like it. It's 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 trying to sell you on say if you feel like you're transgender then that's what you are and don't try to be no it, it doesn't feel like that. It just feels like you are what you were made to be. And the flavor of the movie is is like conservative. Again, weird because it's Disney. So there you go. I don't have any crosstalk because I have never seen any Wreck It Ralph movie. The sequel is worthless. Yeah, the sequel's not very good. But the first Wreck It Ralph movie is great. Yeah. It really is. I just there's a certain there's certain blind spots I have because I haven't had kids and there's just not much of an excuse usually to watch Rick and I guess Ben I, has a lot of time on his hands. But. I, I watched it with Bob Kaplowitz and I... Oh, I think it's a kind of... I mean... You could turn it on with Meredith. Yeah, no, I realize these movies, some of these movies do night. transcend. Yeah, lot, lots of yeah. Pixar movies, Disney Pixar type yeah. movies make for just a fine, fun date night. Yeah. Yes. Jake, your number seven. My number seven is The Sound of Music because I couldn't not put it on my list. <laughs> and I really wanted to not put it on my list. Yeah. You did. I couldn't not put I, it And, on and I just feel bad because... I'm unfairly relying on you to do my dirty work. Like yeah. I, I, I knew you were going to put it on your list, like even before we talked. And I didn't want to, but I, I really did. I was like, "There's no way Jake list. leaves that off." So that means yeah. it's going to get covered, and I can do something more esoteric and nerdy. Yeah. <laughs> but the sound of music is one of the best family entertainments ever made. It's a great score. It's it's. Julie Andrews perfect in every way transcending like just burning up the screen with her charisma and charm and yeah so uh, it, yeah yeah I mean what can we say yeah, about part, part of, of uh, part of even how I thought about this is like you, so you said you're assuming that you know you're bringing Beauty and the Beast to this I'm assuming that you're raising your kids on a desert island and you don't know what movies to introduce them you've to. just got 10 yeah mm-hmm. you just have 10 and how do you grow up without my favorite things and yeah well, I, I think this whole thing works better as like, we, we rely on Jake to establish the baseline of classic <laughs> movies. Right. And then Nathan and Ben fill in the like, yeah, but also. <laughs> right. <laughs> <side of things. laughs> well, the defense I would make of my list is, I think it is helpful for kids to be exposed to modes of entertainment that are different than what they're used to. So that's a good argument for Sound of Music, actually. It's just a little bit slower Mm -hmm. and shot a little bit differently, and it's featuring a different set of actors Mm. than new ones. And I think that in and of itself opens up kids' minds to different kinds of experiences. I think if you can pull off raising your kids to not just always want the best new thing Mm -hmm. but to have a little bit of patience for say a black and white movie or a 1960s julie andrews musical or whatever i think that you've probably made a better kid and i'm not saying i'm going to be able to pull it off i'm going to try but i've never tried before folks so don't hear judgment just hear an ideal okay yeah sound of music rules it's it's great it's exciting it's moving and it's the kind of movie you can grow up with which is fun you can watch it as an adult and totally different things will make you cry suddenly you find yourself identifying with captain von trapp instead of being a scared kid that thinks dad's scary dad's scary yeah Yeah. if you're a man i assume if you're a woman i guess you just always identify with maria but maybe you're liesel for a little bit obviously ben identifies the most with rolf <laughs> he's, he's boy. The boyfriend who becomes a Nazi. Going on yeah. t- 21. He blows a whistle on him. And yeah. 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 Give me the gun, Rolf. I think that's his name, is Rolf, right? Yep. I was going to say Franz, but I think it's definitely Rolf. <laughs> it's one of the two, that's for sure. <laughs> one of the two. Okay. Uh, my number seven is a movie that I'll wager probably a lot of people haven't even heard of. But I highly recommend it, especially for the Indiana Jones crowd that's too young for Indiana Jones or just wants to see where Indiana Jones came from. This is the direct precedent. It is called Gunga Din. It is a movie from 1939 made by Archeo featuring Cary Grant, Victor McLaughlin, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. in a Indian adventure movie, Temple of Doom specifically, stole a lot of tropes from this movie because it's basically the, the British versus... The Tugs, Thugs, whatever you call them, you know, the Kali mm-hmm. cult, cultists. And we have the evil, bloodthirsty Kali cultists f- versus the noble 
British imperialists. And Cary Grant is very funny and charming and rides an elephant. This is like his young, energetic, cockney accented part of his career. And so he's like the comic relief. And then you have Douglas Fairbanks Jr., who's very dashing. And you've got Victor McLaughlin, who, if you don't know who he is, he generally played a big, stocky, like best friend of John Wayne. He was like the Brendan, what Brendan Gleason is to William Wallace. Victor McLaughlin was always that to John Wayne in any number of like Calvary pictures and stuff like that. So it's got like great action adventure set pieces. And it's got, I think it's the first recorded trope of we've got our backs up against a wall. We're surrounded by a thousand enemies and we're up on a high thing. So we have to dive, you know, the fugitive did it. The, you know, how many movies have done, we've got to dive several stories into the water to get away from the bad guys that think we have us cornered. Butch Cassidy famously did it. Cool. So yeah, just a great adventure movie. If you like jungle adventure or those kinds of old adventure tropes that are no longer fashionable in the, are more culturally sensitive times, you know, if you like your Tarzans or your, your Red League, your Kipling style stories, your exotic jungle type stories, which, which I, that kind of stuff has just always fired my imagination so much. I love any story where explorers go into the mysterious African jungles or Indian whatever, and they discover cults and temple, you know, all the stuff that Indiana Jones ripped off. I love that mm-hmm. stuff. So this is that it's one of the best it's a, it's, it is a touchstone. You know, if you asked Steven Spielberg, what, what, what is it? What, like, what's the text that you stole Indiana Jones from? It'd be this. And so I recommend it for anyone who's a, a boy at heart and too much of a boy to actually watch an Indiana Jones movie. Uh, so that is my number seven. Let's say our number six. I thought that was number eight. Oh, that was number seven. Yeah, because oh, you yeah. said your record alpha is your number you're seven. Right. Yep, 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 yep. I'm behind. All right. Well, my number six, I was going to go with The Incredibles, but you know what? I'm going to be more obscure. I love The Incredibles. I haven't seen it in a long time. It's a great movie. I, I, I assume it could have gone into What did you say? It's my second runner up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, any one of us, I'm sure we all thought about putting that on our list. Yep. Yeah. So this, this is the, mo- this is alt Pixar. And I, I actually, I don't know when I'd show this to my kids. Cars 2? I'm assuming. Cars a 3, Bugs my friend. <laughs> I've never liked A Bug's Life. A uh, Bug's Life stinks. In my I, I, might, I might like it. If I only saw it the one time in theaters and didn't like it. But The Good Dinosaur. I love The Good Dinosaur. I've never seen that one. I've actually never seen that one either. I just assumed it was dumb. It looked dumb, Well, frankly. I, the reason I haven't seen it is because everybody I've talked to about it's like, yo, existential. Yes. Talk about existential horror. Yeah. No, it is. It is, and that's why it might not even should be on this list. I'm putting it on anyway, mm. because it, it's like <laughs> if you take American Tale and then you amp it up, and you're like, ah, we're not going to comfort you, <laughs> <laughs> Fievel. <laughs> no comfort for you, Fievel. No, your your dad's just dead. I'm sorry. Sorry, Littlefoot. <laughs> it, yeah, it, so it really, I don't know. I actually feel bad about putting it on the list. You gotta be kids. exist to the existential. If you have, if you have older kids, then, yeah, it, then they could watch it. That's what I have to say about that. The animation is beautiful. The music is great. It makes you cry. I don't know. And it introduces you to the existential horror of existence. It does. So. in a way that's <laughs> <laughs> that your kids will never forget. <laughs> Every list needs something that will scar your children. <laughs> <laughs> That's been all, right. all of Ben's list. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, we could just say. I thought the last Starfighter was going to be on your list, but. The I last. Know. I never saw that as a kid. I've never even seen the whole thing. Oh. You know, my list is woefully short on things that will scar people as kids. Watch The Witches, though. There's a freebie for you. It's not There's on my list, freebie. but uh, yeah. Raul Dahl's The Witches, the 90s version, the Nicholas Roeg yep. film. Yep. Quite scarring and yep. quite good. Well, um, just people can just sub out The Incredibles, which is a much more warm and affirming film and probably probably just a better film. But I like Good Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's right, right there in the title. It's right there in the title. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the mediocre dinosaur. <laughs> nope. Okay, there you go. Well, you go. Uh, you, that's the one that you, I'm most sold on. I, I think I have to watch this now. I, never, I just thought it looked lame. So... No, it's not lame. All right, that was Ben's number 
Number six. six. Jake, you're number six. My number six. You guys burned your Muppets early, and I definitely went with the Muppet Christmas Carol. Nice. <laughs> Good choice. Awesome. Uh, we, needed, we needed a Christmas movie on the list, and yeah. this is the one. And it's the Muppets. So you get the Muppets, you get Christmas, and you get all the things. Another raising the stakes on the special effects, you get Kermit skating. Yeah. yeah. He just skates. I forgot about that. Yeah. You get a great Michael Caine performance as Ebenezer <laughs> yeah, Scrooge too. played absolutely straight, which is the only way to play it and wonderful. Yep. You get some of the best Muppets. I, I love the music in the Muppet movie. I love the music in the new Muppets. I think it was done by Fly the Flight of the Congords guys. It's huh. got that, are you a man? Yeah. And I love the music in uh, Muppet Christmas Carol. Those, yeah. those scores are often written by Paul Williams, famous for writing a bunch of pop songs that you've heard of from the 60s hmm. oh boy what is his most famous paul williams it's not a name i know yeah he's like this little guy he just he wrote the he wrote a bunch of stuff that that you would know so he wrote an old-fashioned love song which three dog night just an old-fashioned love song he wrote we've only just begun he wrote rainy days and mondays and probably the most famous song that he wrote is from the muppet movie which is the rainbow connection in terms of just being up there with memory and certain other things is just classic elevator music. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he wrote the songs from Muppet Christmas Carol, which are really dorky, but they get stuck in my head. I think of this whole Christmas season, I was singing that dumb, it's getting warm by the fire, something, something. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that one. <laughs> Wherever <laughs> you now. find love, it feels like Christmas. Oh <laughs> <laughs> it is <laughs> the season of the spirit. <laughs> The message, if you hear it, oh, <laughs> is make it last all year. <laughs> uh, and Disney Plus, I think, has restored or was in the process of restoring, last I heard, the big love song that has been cut out for years and years from home video releases. Yeah, I think I remember reading about that, too. Yeah. I, was it cut out? Yeah, so the, the VHS that probably we all grew up with had it. But, I, yeah, I remember it. I remember yeah. always fast forwarding it. Yeah, because <laughs> it's it's dumb. <laughs> well, this, the Disney Corporation was like, everyone's going to fast forward this. Let's just cut it out. So the DVD version and all the streaming versions I for years and years have had it cut out, and people have nostalgia for it. So they've actually restored it. So now a new generation can fast forward it. <laughs> yeah, no, that movie has great Muppet meta humor. Uh, I love the great uh, Gonzo and Rizzo, and Rizzo, 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 Rizzo as, as Charles Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love the part where he says, should we be up here? And then he says, Scrooge is saved. What can happen to us now? And then Scrooge throws open the windows <laughs> and sends <laughs> them flying. <laughs> yeah, some of the best Muppet slapstick. Uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's, 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 it's a legitimately great movie. So I'm glad we all, I'm so happy that we all got a Muppet movie on there. <laughs> I, I thought they were going to be underrepresented. I thought I just had to. <laughs> they may be overrepresented. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. But <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but they really are fun and pretty safe kids movies. Yeah. There's always a little bit of uh, an adult edge to them, but in the gentlest, gentlest way possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I admire that about the Muppets. Okay. So that was Jake's number six. Yep. Which means I have to give my number six. My number six... I kind of want to do a tie here, but I guess I'm not allowed to do a tie, right? It's pretty cheap. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with a Christmas movie, actually. And this movie definitely has some bad content, but it's uh, the kind of bad content that appears in an innocent 1950s film, so it just gets grandfathered in and no one cares. Basically, it's got some, it's got some revealing outfits. But White Christmas is... Oh, I thought you were... Going with the Christmas movie. Christmas story. Christmas story, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I, thought too. It's like, yeah. I was like, interesting. Yeah, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Christmas story is fine. I, I, I love a Christmas story. White I'm Christmas a, is a good pick, but it does have some... It's, it's, got, it's just got some, outfits, it's got some revealing dancing outfits, like, if, uh, you know, Bob Fosse type outfits. So you can't... Yeah. No, no other way to say it. But... So my other pick would have been the court jester. I just think kids should be familiar with Danny Kaye. I think he's a great and under represented and under loved these days comedian and he's just one of those guys i don't even know why it's like his shtick if you look on the page isn't that funny but his delivery is just he knows how to he has that like stage honed precision that certain performers have where it's just like he's timed this so well and he's doing it such simple stuff so perfectly 
that you still kind of have to laugh, even if you're a hip adult person who's like seen all these joke forms a million times. And like, there's nothing that just like punches you in the gut funny about any of the material that Danny Kaye has to work with in White Christmas or Court Jester, but especially mm-hmm. White Christmas. But he just makes it work. He's really funny. And he's really great with Bing Crosby in that movie. And it's got a handful of classic Irving Berlin songs and wonderful dance numbers and, you know, pretty ladies. And it's got that sister's number, which any woman who's ever had a sister loves that number. And it's got everything. It's got some sentiment with the general at the end. And it's just uh, one of my nostalgically favorite Christmas movies. Not one of the best movies on my list, like objectively speaking, but it's a movie that I would rather watch with Amanda after the kids go to bed than with the kids. That's fair. I think that's but, totally fair. But yeah, I think for the right kind of kid, say a girl of the right age who's into dancing, maybe, or it, it might really hit for the wrong kid at the wrong age. It might really miss, <laughs> but and for the wrong kid at the right hit, right to, at the exact wrong age, like say a boy of a certain age it might uh, really miss in a really bad way because it's got all that cleavage and stuff but and the incredibly long legs of vera whatever her name is the second sister who is an incredible athlete but so there's a certain part of me that's glad they featured those legs just because the athletic performance of those legs is something but i mean when she does that cartwheel down Down the the stairs stairs. assisted by all those gentlemen it's pretty cool there's a lot of great dancing in that movie but yeah, maybe it is more of a... Well, uh, Lyle actually requested some movies to watch as a couple. So there we go. It's our couple's pick. White Christmas. Great movie. Holiday Inn is actually a much better movie. And that has Fred Astaire and stuff like that. But White Christmas is nostalgically and sentimentally my hmm. favorite. Okay. Number five. Well, let's continue our plunge into darkness with Ben's list. Okay. I'm just going to I'm just going to do what you dared me to do basically and put Return to Oz here. Because as a I mean as a kid again, I loved this movie. I read the Oz books. I grew up watching first of all, I grew up watching Wizard of Oz like mm-hmm. a kid that I knew. Right. And uh, it's okay. I don't think I I don't remember ever asking for it, but I do remember watching it a lot. But I read the Oz books. The Oz books are just weird, whimsical kids' fantasies. Mm -hmm. Return to Oz is like, let's take that weird, whimsical kids' fantasy and play it straight, and then let's make it even darker. Yeah. And because they're not actually that dark, as I recall. But Return to Oz is like a dark kids' movie that is a really cool visual fantasy world that feels like you just entered the world of the books. And it has Jack Pumpkinhead, everyone's favorite Oz character. Mm -hmm. Yay for Jack Pumpkinhead. (laughs) The- I'm going to miss you most of all, Jack Pumpkinhead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that there's, I mean, he's, he has a pumpkin head. Yeah. He's, he's a very charming, whimsical kid's character. And the whole movie just feels like Frank Baum's imagination, which when you read the books as a kid, it's like limitless. Mm-hmm. Let's just invent another land. Okay, here's 10 more characters. Okay, here's 10 more places. Okay, here's a series of 10 more random inventions or or adventures. And Bomb was always doing that in those books. And this movie has that feeling. Right. It's too dark for younger kids. It's the, it it was the scariest thing I could watch as a kid, but I loved it for that reason. I don't like horror. I didn't as a kid and I don't now, but I like things that verge up on horror. Mm -hmm. And this won't scare you as an adult, but for your kids, you should be careful. It's pretty eerie. That's got that headless woman who's got like a hall of heads that she, she puts on different. Heads. She puts on different heads, mm-hmm, and she's mm-hmm. kind of spectral. It's also got <laughs> just fair warning for. I love oh, this movie. Man. I watched that scene actually this morning. <laughs> Which one? I know what you're going to say. The, you're gonna talk about the electroshock. Yes, yes, yes. Where Dorothy almost gets electroshock. Yeah, treatment. but just the idea. It's that horrible. Dorothy from Oz, yeah. the American symbol of innocence. From like, can you name a more symbol of uh, like an, yeah. I, an icon of little girl uh, pigtailed innocence from? Pollyanna. uh, Yeah, Pollyanna. Pollyanna, Same thing, though. (laughs) If we made a movie, Pollyanna 2, and it started with, we don't believe you, Pollyanna. You're going to go to an asylum, and you're going to get shock therapy. (laughs) It's it's like, it's... (laughs) It's, it's actually, it's a great ad of, in and of itself, it's not bad, but for anyone who's bringing memories of the MGM Technicolor musical, it is so tasteless to start with that. You, I think that you could, you could successfully fast forward that scene and just 
ignore it. Yeah, he kind of got to get her to Oz, but I, I don't. Even, I don't. I don't even remember that scene as a kid. Yeah, I don't mind the scene in and of itself. I just think it just feels like such a middle finger to uh, the yeah, to the movie no, that we all grew up with. It's mean. Yeah, well, I mean, if if the original Wizard of Oz is like this Technicolor fantasy version of Frank L. Baum, this movie feels a lot more muted and autumnal and like as if you found an and old it's not musty a yeah it's not a musical mm-hmm. like as if you found an old musty copy of frank old bomb and it had those black and white illustrations and then that kind of came to life mm-hmm. more accurately it feels like that so it's creepy and interesting but yeah for the for the right kind of kid i'd say uh, i loved it your yeah. mileage may vary <laughs> do not go into it expecting a straightforward exciting whimsical fun sequel to no somewhere over the rainbow and all that sort of stuff nope but if you're expecting something more along the lines of the 80s fantasy you think about like movies like willow and legend and stuff and then imagine that somebody actually did a good version of one of those pieces of crap it's it's kind of like that i I forgot about willow i loved that as a kid i would never have put that on this list no me neither but willow is gross yeah willow's gross I grew up with it too. Yeah, I, I like watched it. Over I liked it. I watched it a lot as a kid. Too. Val Kilmer but as yeah, the Mad sh- Mortigan. Mad Mortigan. Oh, yeah. Mad Mortigan. Man, awesome. Uh, Jake- That's how familiar I am with it. Instant pull. Instant pull. Yeah. I don't know that I ever. I saw it on TV some, but I don't, I don't know that oh, I ever man. actually watched it through. My mom loved it. That's what I remember. She was like, yes. "Oh, Willow's a great fantasy movie." Well, I'll tell you guys one good thing that happened. I, me and Ben especially, are snobby enough to often bemoan this, but something good that happened was that. Lord of the Rings came out and set a certain template for fantasy movies. And then everybody could just forget all the 80s fantasy movies. Because who cares about Willow? Dark Crystal. And and Red Sonja and the Conan movies, kind of. Like, some of those are still Mm -hmm. nostalgically favorites. But Peter Jackson so elevated what fantasy did that it kind of just made all that stuff. Reset button. It just hit the reset button. I I kind of like like Sam Raimi with superhero movies. Yeah, I think that's Mm. true. Yeah, that's true. I kind of liked Dark Crystal as a kid, but I don't think it's good. Me and, me and my family tried to watch Dark Crystal, and we did not. And I, I love Muppets, and I love the magic of Muppets. And that, that, that coffee table book that I had had a huge chapter on Dark Crystal, so I remember being fascinated by it. But we couldn't make it through just because it, it was too weird, I it's guess. It's weird. It's actually, it's on the, it's a very dark, like kind of ugly fantasy movie is what I remember. Yeah. Like, like if you're going to... F- it feels very pagan, very like let's pull in bad spiritual influences and visualize like some really weird. Well, when I picture a fantasy movie from that era, it's always sort of has that feeling of it's it's even just the visual look is always dingy. It always yeah. feels like there's dirt on the camera and the characters are in mud and it just feels kind of whether it's Willow or Conan or it's like this is a degraded world because it's fantasy. Right. It's yeah. like, that's what their take. That's what Hollywood's take on fantasy was. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's not, yeah. it's not what fantasy actually has to offer. That's best. Okay. So moving on from that. So Willow is your number five recommendation. Uh, <laughs> right. Conan the Barbarian. It was, it was Return to Oz. Return to Oz. Yes. You know what? I think in a, in a more honest list, Good Dinosaur would be 10. Return to Oz would be nine because they're such like, hey, parents, be careful. Also, I love these movies. Right. So, take that for what it's worth. Jake, your number five? My number five is my first and only, well, no, my first Disney offering, and it's Sleeping Beauty. Yes, um, you, you are famously a Sleeping Beauty. I don't know that you're an apologist, because I think everybody does like this movie. You don't have to apologize for it, but you love it more than a lot of people do, I think. More than a lot of people. I I picked it because... We, you needed a. I needed a representative Disney film, and it's as iconic and stylish and beautiful and unobjectionable as any. It's playing with all the big tropes. The animation is just gorgeous. The music is good. Once Upon a Dream is a, a good song. Yeah, I think um, if it had one more good song, that would probably elevate its game quite a bit in terms of cultural uh, memory. It's, it's even got you know the 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 fairy godmothers are cute and fun and mm-hmm. it's it's got enough whimsy in it and the best boss the, battle of any disney movie yeah, the dragon yeah. and i mean maybe you could argue aladdin but i'm i'm saying no maleficent is awesome yeah, and prince whatever is it, it's not prince eric what, prince, philip. Philip, philip versus maleficent is awesome yeah, yeah. and just like I, the way that the very stylized animation plays into that fight and plays into just a tapestry feel of it 
I just, it, to me, it stands apart. It, you know, you could put either of the Cinderella's, you could put Beauty and the Beast, you could put lots of other Disney things in there if you wanted to. But for something that feels like it stands apart, I felt like this was the one to represent uh, Disney animated classics on my list. So mm -hmm. I, I'd respect a lot of other decisions, but it, it also avoids a lot of the objections that you could have with, with, with other. This is picks. before the feminism took hold of it, certainly. And yeah, we, we, we can have an argument about beauty and the beast and what's good or bad about it, but we don't have to even, we don't have, have anything to argue about with sleeping beauty. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why it is in my top five. I think it's a super solid choice. The reason I wouldn't make the same choice is because it's a movie that I think I had personally, I admire it more than I love it. Like it's doing so many things and they're so cool, but I just, I don't really love Aurora. Like she doesn't speak to me and I'm not sure that Prince Philip, he's pretty cool. They're both pretty cool. I like what we have of them. I wish we had. He's the first step forward. I think in terms of giving any Prince Charming some character and something interesting. Yeah, I feel like we're kind of... He's got a relationship with his horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is fun and um, a little bit... Uh, I, I feel like we're kind of caught in between... Like, we have the really old Disney movies like Snow White where we're just playing pure archetype. And then we have fully fleshed out characters later, you know, with uh, Belle and all that. But... Sleeping Beauty, unfortunately, is just a little bit caught where they try to flesh them out a little bit, but then they don't really. I'm not criticizing. I think, yeah, I think, a, that's, I think that's fair. It's a um, beautiful, beautiful movie. One of the best looking and best feeling Disney movies. Yeah. Just the forest, the way that forest I looks. Know. Yeah. Forest I just awesome. want to live there. I mean, I could talk myself into Raptures for this movie. I think it's a great choice. I just was providing yeah. some commentary, I guess, some color comment. My color commentary is it's easier to admire than to love. I think that that's true. I think that it's also easy to focus on some of the bigger things and and lose just some of the the fun, sweet, light, funny mm -hmm. human touches to it. Like, I think what, my first thought when I think about Sleeping Beauty is I think of the forest. Yeah. I think of the style. I think of Maleficent. I think of the dragon and the green fire and the little demons that like are carrying, mm -hmm. you know, people away. And I forget like, oh, the the dads drinking and- Having a pillow fight or something like that. The dads are pretty funny. I, I don't remember exactly how, but- Yeah, there's some stuff. Like, he, he's not, he's actually swinging a pillow at, I think the the messenger. Or whatever. Right, right, right. But there's this like Philip and then the two dads and all that stuff that you don't, and then all the fairy godmother stuff. To, that brings some color and humor, I think, to it. Yeah. And the action rocks, and uh, we haven't even said the greatest attribute that that movie has, which is the first great Disney villain, I think. Maleficent's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's the first She's the first one to bring just a little style and a little camp to it. We went yeah. full camp with Ursula, you know, uh, 30 years yeah. later. But yeah. Maleficent is the first one to just get a little camp, which is fun, without overdoing yeah. it. Ursula, when you watch it now, it's like, oh. They're just doing Divine from John Waters. But this is just gross. But <laughs> yeah, Maleficent's awesome. Too bad Angelina Jolie had to sully her name. But I love the original. Yep. Yeah. I, when I, I remember loving that as a kid because it does. It feels like you're just inside a storybook. Yeah. Right. There's, I mean, it may or may not be on my list or have been on my list before Jake brought it up. But yeah. It's allowed to be on your list. Yeah. yeah. Ben's list is like... Maleficent itself, it's transforming. Yeah, to try it might to, be to transforming meet, as it goes. Meet we'll the battles see. of the time. Okay, my list, okay, number my number five is another classic adventure film that I think everyone should be familiar with, which is, and I was torn between two, but I went with the much more famous one. So at first I was going to say Captain Blood, but that was too nerdy of a pick. <sighs> That's what I was going to guess you were going to say. Yeah, but then I just decided, come on, Nathan, don't say Captain Blood, you snob, you snot. Take out your say monocle Robin and Hood. say The Adventures of Robin Hood. Errol Moore, or Errol Moore says The Adventures of Robin Hood. Errol Flynn. His documentary <laughs> <laughs> examining. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, Errol Flynn's Robin Hood, like the iconic adventure movie of all iconic adventure movies. Still one of the top sword fights to beat Flynn versus Rathbone. 
Uh, great cast. Nobody was beautiful, more beautiful than it's Olivia. The Dale shadows and, and everything. Yeah, it's the yeah. shadows. It's been parodied so many times. They're fighting in front of the candles and the big shadows. Yeah, it's one on of those wall. things that when you watch it, you're like, oh, that's where that's from. That's where that came from. I've seen yeah. Daffy Duck do that. I've seen, you know, how many people. Yeah. Flynn's just great. He's able to play that kind of hero without a lot of irony or yeah, just maybe 3% wink just to make it palatable, kind of similar to what Christopher Reeve does with Superman so many years later. But it's just earnest and fun, and I think the action's still pretty good if your brain hasn't been battered by too many CGI battles in Marvel movies. And Claude Rains is awesome as the effeminate King John, and nobody was ever more beautiful than Olivia de Havilland, and she, she could play. She could give as good as she got when it came to all the banter and stuff, and Flynn and de Havilland's chemistry was off the charts in those days. They're both they were both the most beautiful people and it's just everything that Hollywood does best. Big splashy technicolor extravaganza it's Robin Hood. I mean, what I, it's got, he's got a little John, he's got Will Scarlet. He's got, he shoots arrows at stuff. What else do you need to know? Watch this movie, brainwash your kids into liking it and then give them Raiders of the Lost Ark. But <laughs> you know, let them, let them, build up to some of the stuff that came along and blew it away. You know, you don't have to start by watching Mad Max Fury Road. Then everything's going to seem lame. You know, you start with some slower car car movies. So, you know, then you, you'll have earned it when you get to Mad Max Fury Road. So don't, don't start with Indiana Jones. Start with Errol Flynn and Adventures of Robin. And it's so much more wholesome than those movies. But it's still super exciting. And it's still got, you know, romance and... It's just a wonderful film and one that I really loved. And my stupid, stupid generation, my dumb generation of parents and dumb generation of kids, we grew up with that stupid, violent, mean-spirited, sexually debauched, Prince of campy Thieves. Alan Rickman performance of a silly, ridiculous <laughs> Kevin Costner movie, <laughs> yeah. which is such a bad Robin Hood movie, and we all kind of thought it was a good Robin Hood movie because yep. we just didn't know any better. Yeah. So I wasn't allowed to watch that as a kid. So the Robin Hood, the I live action was. Robin Hood that I grew up with, I saw it when I was like uh, in high school, finally. Right. The Robin Hood that I kind of grew up with was a made for TV with Patrick Bergan and Uma Thurman as Maid Marian. <laughs> weird. It's weird. I, it's fun. It's campy. It's not as debauched. It's still fairly violent, but it's a made for TV Robin Hood that is more straightforwardly heroic and it's really weird that that Kevin Costner Robin had got a pass. I just can't. This is one of those things that was, just got yeah. you watch it now and it's like it's it's so rapey at the end and it's it's, it's just yeah. like it's insane. I I haven't gone back and watched it since I was a kid, but I remember all of it. Yeah, I do too. That I, movie didn't do like, good things for me. I yeah. Yeah. It's a horrible movie. It's In so many it, it it's not just a bad movie. It's just it has so much bad in it. Well, Kevin Costner, he's one of these guys, he plays like an all-American type that you love, like a wholesome, he plays wholesome about as well as anybody, but then you watch the movies and you realize how much control he had over those movies and you watch the choices that he made and the ways that the the sex politics pay out. Waterworld, also gross. Yeah, it's like there's always going to- Kevin gonna, just a gross guy. There's always going to be the Kevin threat Costner. of rape. He's, there's always going to be yeah. the threat of yeah. brutal violence. There's always going to be like a hand chopped off in a- dank dungeon but like he's just a sick guy and that movie's sick and the only redeeming quality is that alan rickman cashed a giant paycheck i assume he bought a big house somewhere and had the time of his life playing in a completely different movie which i'd, I'd love to see the movie that was all <laughs> just the terrible camp that alan Rick out with a spoon but man what a mean-spirited they, they make sure to include an f word it's just like that movie sucks. I mean, that's not what this podcast is about. But there were two Robin Hoods that people liked. There's that. And then one day we're just going to have to litigate this. I myself, I do not love and I never really have loved the Disney Fox Robin Hood. I think it's one of the weaker slapstick Disney efforts of the 70s. But I know kids love it. And I know everybody loves it. I know I'm a mean ogre. I know I'm basically Prince John. I'm just sucking my thumb. Uh -huh. Yes. Mommy. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's, it's somewhere on my list because it belongs there. On my, not the t top 10. 
Okay. Two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's number the, one. It's at the very, it's like at number 27 or 34. I don't know how many I have. I think of that school of <laughs> lame slapstick Disney movies that aren't even fully animated from like their bad years, I would say 101 Dalmatians is pretty good. Or what's the other one? Lady, where's Lady and the Tramp in there? When was that? I think Lady and the Tramp is actually earlier. I think Disney was still alive or just recently mm-hmm. dead for that. Jungle Book, though, is probably Disney was still. I think he died like while it was in production. Jungle Book is the kind of slapstick Disney that I think works the best. But man, I don't love that Robin Hood movie. I understand why people like it. The folk score is real catchy. I really like the, the music. It's the main reason. But then, like all the Southern fried tropes, like, having the sheriff of Nottingham just talk like this is like so many head scratcher choices that you accept as a kid, and then you watch it, and you're like. Why did they do that? And then, and then if you're not a snob, you say, well, it worked. You liked it as a kid. But if you're me, you say, but I don't like it now. Anyway, one day we'll just have to do that one, I guess. We should just do like a, a Robin Hood retrospective because it's fun to talk about Robin Hood movies. Although that would be terrible because we'd have to watch that Kevin Costner thing. No. Russell um, Crowe. Russell Crowe. Oh, boy. Okay. Taron Edgerton. Yeah, let's not do a Robin Hood. On second thought, let's not do a Robin Hood. There's only one Robin Hood movie that any person needs in their movie diet and that is errol flynn he's the first he's the best he's not the first but he's the first one that mattered awesome day i'll see it (laughs) yeah it's great Uh, so that's your number five that's my number five okay number four ben number four all right i was trying to pick i was trying to pick a miyazaki I figured Jake would pick Totoro, so I didn't put that. <laughs> <laughs> we both cashed in so hard on the fact that we knew what Jake would do, Jake. which is so unfair to Jake. Uh, but <laughs> Jake could have just gone esoteric, and then we would have all just been caught with like, here's a bunch of weird crap you'll never watch. There are there are a couple that, that you could watch that are not Spirited Away, which is weird and recommended for older kids with parental guidance. There's Castle in the Sky. That's an early Miyazaki. It's just like... A fun, bouncy kids adventure film. Mm -hmm. It's quite Uh, good. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I liked it a lot. The music is cool. It has a little moral at the end about power. Mm -hmm. Miyazaki's films always have morals. Some some morals. Some of his morals are better than others of his morals. Some of them are better than others. This one was fine, I remember. Yeah. And this isn't necessarily a masterpiece or anything, but it is fun. And it's cool. And it's different. It's like, if you want your kids to know what a different style of animation looks like, my neighbor Totoro. Mm-hmm. Is much more of a masterwork of animation, but this one is fun and and different enough that they'll be interested. I think so. Castle in the Sky, that, that's, Castle that's what in you're the Sky, with? or Laputa Castle in the Sky, or I feel like it has two or three different titles. Been released by Disney. I don't know if it's on Disney Plus or everything's on HBO. That Studio Ghibli, right? Yeah, and I don't know, even know if Castle of the Sky is there right now, but it cycles through sometimes. Mm-hmm. So, and that movie has a scene where a guy flexes his muscles and then his shirt tatters does it yes. you, i haven't seen it recently i, I i've not seen it recently like either but that that image is always <laughs> i just remember stuck in it, my mind. it has this they awaken this this ancient robot yes and the robot is like an incredibly powerful weapon and it starts destroying this tower and it was i remember it was really it's just really intense most of the movie is pretty lighthearted, though right well miyazaki is uh, something that should be part of every well-rounded cinema diet at some age so i support that choice jake your number four. My Don Bluth choice, an American tale. Excellent choice. Yeah, pretty great. Anything you'd like to add to the Don Bluth discussion? I mean, an American tale has, it hits different ways as a kid and as an adult. It has great songs. It has great one. music. Mm-hmm. It has. Which Don Bluth generally can't be relied on to have songs worthy of the Disney corpus in his movies, but in that one he does. Mm-hmm. It really uh, taps into the nature of childhood and the fears of being a child and and it's um, yeah it's almost it's almost too much <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah it's a lot and it's a part of why you can when we hit my top four here and this is the beginning of it it's sort of why spider-man into the spider-verse is here or my neighbor totoro is here like those are the gentle non-challenging versions of some of the same kind of things, yeah it's man. like if all you had were an american tale and the rest of my top four then it's just going to be like oh well, I don't know that I want to watch in any movies anymore. Yep. Maybe so. that's our secret goal with this list is to make kids hate <laughs> movies, which I think some of our listeners might might be okay with. So there you go. Just show your kids Return to Oz mm. and say it's a direct sequel to Wizard of Oz. Prep them for that. Prep them for that. 
<laughs> you remember all the joy and fun from that movie? <laughs> hey, it, it, so many amazing things about an American tale, including the songs. If you think about No Cat in America, mm-hmm. like, uh, when's the last time you've remembered the verses of that? It's probably You have this, never. like, grand, there are no cats in America, mm-hmm. streets are paved with cheese, right? And then you come back down, and it's, like, three stories about how I, I was walking through the field with my true love fair, and a calico caught us by surprise. And a flash of teeth and fur, her tail is all he left of her. Whoa. I right? don't remember like, that. Yeah, so it's like these verses. It's like this, this, the, the Italian mouse lost his mother and brother. The Irish mouse lost his true love fair. And, and Papa Moskowitz lost his entire family. And that's how it starts. And was just left alone as an orphan. And so it's like it comes way down into these like little like spotlight things. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, it's just, it's just uh, like horror. I remember this now, but it, but it's and then it goes with bouncy folk song style. And right? then it goes, but but there are no cats in That's a man. Right, I yeah. forgot this. Yeah, but it's just like. <gasps> That's how actual folk songs work too. The, right, like the darkest yeah. stuff. Right, but if that's anyone's... the way the whole movie works. Yeah. That's right. It's like that's right. all of these really intense, like deeply, yeah, terrifying and real and sad I remember things that, that are as a kid. true to life. Yes, with you know, bouncy folks, you know, humor and slapstick, and it's it's woven together so masterfully. It's, it's such a great movie. Well, it's so weird like the specificity of Fivel Mouskowitz's journey is so not what animation usually you know I mean okay sure her name is Belle and maybe we know the name of the village but really she lives in any village comma fairy tale land and this is the castle and this is the beast even with those characters as well rounded as they are it's like we're just kind of using animation to deal with iconography and with... Yeah, Don Bluth isn't really like that, though. No, Don Bluth likes to tell specific stories, and this one is a Jewish, a Russian-Jewish immigrant story told with mice. And it's like, I don't know why that works. I don't know why it doesn't come across as the most tasteless piece of stupidity. I don't know why it's not just as dumb as... I mean, I do know, because he does it well. That's the answer. He pulls it Mm. off. But... This is the Even same Spielberg is standing b- behind. Yeah, him. I think that's a, probably a lot of it. But, you know, this is the same instinct that got us a, a weird, sexy gangster story with all dogs go to heaven and stuff like that. Like, this is a guy that wants to just tell an adult story and couch it in kids terms. And this is one of the more successful mm-hmm. iterations of that. But it's just when you think about how terribly wrong that movie could go. I mean, we're watching the Jesh- the Russians decimate a Jewish village but it's played as cats and mice. Like Mm -hmm. that's such a stupid idea if it's done poorly. And it's such a good idea if it's done the 1% chance of a way that it's done, which is, Mm -hmm. which is correctly, but it walks the knife edge and it does it to perfection. The whole, the whole movie through. Yeah. Like with Tammany hall. I mean, it's just, it's so specific. We're going to do Tammany hall. We're going to do all these like tropes from, from the immigrant experience. I mean, why would kids care about like a Tammany Hall politician, a corrupt Tammany Hall politician? Like who thinks to put that in a kid's movie? It's such a weird, it's like gangs of New York colon the kids movie. Like yeah. it's, yeah. it, that movie should not work. Honest John's running around drunk. Like, yeah. Kids, you know, kids and, like good storytelling. Yeah. Kids actually. just like good stories. That's it. doesn't condescend. No. I mean, it was a good enough idea. The mice thing to be picked up by, Art Spiegelman years later and turned into a famous graphic novel. Mouse. Mouse which yeah. is about, you know, Jews surviving the Holocaust and the Germans are the cats. Um, right. And it works really well, but it's the same thing. Well, the genius of that is not every Holocaust story actually has to be Schindler's List. You can find a way to artistically distance yourself enough from it mm-hmm. that you can give yourself fully to engaging with it without losing your mind yeah um or and that's something so gross no one should read it yeah exactly you could argue nobody should watch schindler's list because you're just gonna have to watch naked people and bullets go into heads and stuff like that but you turn it into mice suddenly you can tell that story and that's exactly what an american tale does so well is it it just tells one of these stories it tells an immigrant's story but and it has the same feel of you know americana yeah. that was painted by 
all the Broadway plays Mm -hmm. of the first half of the 20th century that shaped the whole 20th century. It it taps into those things too. Like, yeah, it's like uh, in the Godfather part two, when Robert De Niro is in Italy and then he comes and he has to go, he has to make his way. This movie actually taps into that sort of feeling and just the sound of the docks and the creaking of the ships. And it's, it actually gives you a mental image of what it all what the immigrant it's, experience would have been like and, and fiddler on the roof but yeah, yeah, yeah. In america but you know and then and then of course there's five goes west o- oklahoma even know. better even more a realistic take on a, a western yeah. town where, exactly you yeah. know so, sheriff, jimmy stewart and his greatest role of all time using his burping powers <laughs> It's as, a pretty fun movie. As Wiley Burp. Oh, I loved. If we yeah, were just it was go, my favorite as a kid. When, sometime we two, should just do sure. pure 10 crappy nostalgia picks. And probably my number one crappy nostalgia pick would be <laughs> Five of Goes West. Yeah, that's up Man, there for me too. That, that, would, that would get you stuff like Flight of the Navigator and the Explorers mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Cloak and Dagger and stuff that... Maybe we shouldn't do that. But <laughs> maybe not. Goonies. No, don't do that. Yeah, no, don't do, do that. that. No, that's, let's not. <laughs> <clears throat> Dogfish. That's what, uh, what Tigger says after he, or Tiger, whatever his name is, after he, he's been running from dogs for like a half an hour of hilarious slapstick, and then he gets to the water, and he thinks he's safe. And there's a fish, <laughs> and it starts barking at him, and he looks at the camera, and dogfish he shrugs dogfish. his shoulders, kind of <laughs> says, oy vey, dogfish. <laughs> <laughs> Tom DeLuise, <laughs> cashing that paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> totally forgot about that. Uh, you're number four, Nathan. Uh, my number four. All right. This is probably, this is about as your kids should like this, but I have no idea whether they actually would. And I suspect maybe they wouldn't unless you get a mer- you brainwash them young. But I just think every person should have one of these movies in their vocabulary of movies that they are conversant with. And this is a Stare and Rogers greatest film, Swing Time. Great movie. Great movie. Great couples movie. How about that? Yeah. You know, you just want like a, a family film, like something that's not going to, it's going to be pretty wholesome. Although Astaire and Rogers do know how to communicate sex through the medium of dance. Boy, do they ever. Boy, do they ever. And so you don't need explicit sex scenes when you have two great dancers going at it. And this movie Making has, love to each other while they're dancing. And this movie has the most uh, famous example of that, which is where uh, he's, I think, the plot's so silly. It's some sitcom plot, but she, at the moment in the movie, he's broken her heart or she's broken his heart or something. And then they come together and they, they dance it out. It, I, I'm sorry to, to sound really dorky, but I got chills thinking about it just now. Huh. It's like, it's it incredible. Is so po- potent. Yeah. It's one of the most potent dance scenes. I, it, it probably is the most potent dance scene. Yeah. Of no. all time. <laughs> it's it's awesome and but you've also got special you've got some of the other most be, in different ways potent you've got uh, some of the best one of the best comedy numbers and pick yourself up you've got uh, bojangles of harlem not the most politically correct a moment in all of cinema yep. but it's fred astaire paying tribute to all the black artists that inspired him and dancing off against his own animated shadow, shadow. Yeah. um which is incredible yeah and it's, so it's just got a handful of the best it's such a good movie. Yeah, no, it's great. And Astaire and Rogers chemistry is off the charts. They actually make all that dialogue stuff work. You know, all the stuff in between the dances is pretty good. And you got great music too. Uh, you got a fine romance with no kissing. And you got a really famous song. What's the famous song from that one? It's like one of the most famous love songs from the American songbook of the yeah, I haven't seen it for so long. Oh, you know, it's the kind of song that like in when Harry met Sally, they're going to play it on the soundtrack and, uh, you know, somebody, somebody famous is going to sing it. Just the way you da, 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 love you. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Just that's the right. way Every you time look tonight. The way you look tonight. Yeah. 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 I think that that's a, a stare for being a great dancer, not the world's most wonderful singer perfectly passable but not great he introduced so many songs to the american songbook that other people would make more famous and that's one of the best (sighs) so wonderful movie that's my number four Mm. ben you're number three well i'll just go with sleeping beauty gonna go with sleeping beauty i wrote it there i didn't change it there you go we already talked about good that. pick. So that's reduced our list of thirty to twenty nine. First need, overlap. We need yeah. one more overlap to get to twenty eight, which is it, what I it predicted. It is certainly happening. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I can. I'm going to say two or three. And unless you guys just really sold out mm-hmm. on a couple movies here. So we already talked about Sleeping Beauty. So my number three. Mm-hmm. If I said my number three is the reason why Superman the movie is my number 10, could you guess what it is? The Incredibles? Yes, it's the Iron Giant. Ah, I thought it might be Brad Bird. <laughs> yeah, and it's also why The Incredibles didn't make the list. Mm. Because... The Iron Giant's better. The Iron Giant, Giant is the better of the two Brad Bird movies. No two ways about it. Yeah. But... I probably like The Incredibles better, but I didn't put either of them on my list. The Incredibles is great, and... The Incredibles, at the end of the day, it's a wonderful deconstruction, but it is a deconstruction, and I've just had so much deconstruction in my life that I'm just, if I have to choose, I'm going to go with the, I mean, I don't have to choose. I love them both equally, but Iron Man, or Iron Man, but Iron Man, (laughs) (laughs) the truly sincere superhero story. Uh, No, the Iron Giant is just a sincere animated fable, and that's all it really is, and I love that quality about it. Yeah. I love the movie. I think it's special and one of Vin Diesel's best performances right up there with Groot. Special in a ton of ways. The style, the story, the nostalgia of it all, that final moment of Superman. It's really, really special. I love it. It's a great movie. We, it's like an American tale. It's not a movie you, we can take a lot of as a family, which again is why we have a couple of the more lighthearted movies at the end mm-hmm. there. So Totoro, Spider-Verse, and Superman the movie. Fairly straightforward, lighthearted, and kind of also inform, you know, the emotional resonance of of the upper picks here. Mm-hmm. So. Great film. If I had thought that you weren't going to put it on, then I would have had to put it on. What was your, oh, your number three was, okay, so we're, mm-hmm. we're burning through them here, folks. Burning through them. Okay, my silent movie pick. I love Buster Keaton. I love Her- Harold Lloyd even more. He is considered the third kind of, you know, the loser who wasn't Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton. But I like that he just played an everyman. He's a guy with the glasses hanging off the clock. That's what you, that's the image yeah. that you know. Buster Keaton is this weird kind of, <laughs> I don't know what he is. He's like this emotionless sprite. It's what gives him his power. He's just like, he's kind of this cartoon figure that just goes through these crazy things and just doesn't bat an eye. It's, it's awesome. And it's, it's relatable in its own way. And Charlie Chaplin famously paid, played the little tramp who was always put upon and he kind of a cartoon figure in his own pathetic way. But uh, Lloyd was you and you or me, you know, he's just like a, he always played a young man who just wanted to make his way in the world. And, he famously started his career not wearing glasses and then discovered if he wore glasses, everybody liked him and thought he was relatable. So he adopted the glasses and the straw hat and everything like that. And generally in his movies, he would be pursuing a girl or pursuing a promotion or whatever, just something very relatable. And some giant slapstick thing would come in his way most famously in Safety Last. He gets himself through a series of sitcom contrivances into a situation where he has to climb a building as the human fly and then the ingenuity of everything that the movie throws at him and the stunt work of a real guy climbing a building, but also just the ingenuity of how many different ways, or it's just something like Spielberg designing the truck chase and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, at, you know, how many different imaginative ways can we threaten somebody? So we'll have windows open. We'll have pigeons. We'll have this clock start to break. We'll have, you know, a dog, bark and start to jump out the window that he has to rescue we'll have hmm. this and that and the other thing it's the same thing that ben was talking about with buster keaton building and layering these gags like in the general he's on this train mm-hmm. it's a very simple setup there's a bad guy train a good guy bike train they're chasing each other and it's just how many different ways can we can we can we give the trains trouble throw stuff on the tracks right how many different problems will our hero right have to solve and there's something that really appeals to me about that kind of clean linear storytelling just like we don't have dialogue we don't have much characterization we ha- we can only do really simple things but we have to make it hilarious we have to make it suspenseful and we have to make it exciting so what can we do working with the the limitations of what we have and all of that kind of stuff and i think probably while buster keaton is the clear artistic winner of the big three uh, most critics you know would agree keaton at his best was better than chaplin and certainly better than lloyd i think lloyd is the funniest and most relatable and the one that 
maybe you'd have a shot with some kids uh, might actually like mm. him. They, 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 I'm sure they'd love Keaton too. Beating up on Keaton to elevate Lloyd here a little bit, but Keaton probably doesn't deserve it. I haven't it. seen Lloyd yet, so I want to. Uh, Safety Last is great. That's the one where he climbs the building. Super iconic. There's a movie called Speedy, which I really love. I'm going to choose one of these here. There's a movie called The Freshman where he goes to college for the first time and has to join the college football team and make a big touchdown so he can win the girl and like every Adam Sandler movie and like everything's <laughs> everything's been ripped off of that formula since then but Harold Lloyd did it first did it best I also like a movie of his called Girl Shy I just really like Harold Lloyd I think he's a great physical performer a great comedian and I guess the one that I'll put on the list is Safety Last cuz you know it's got the clock that he hangs off of and it's a really impressive physical performance. There's some stunt work. There's some stuntmen. There's some places where he's he's not really doing it. But when you know that Harold Lloyd had an accident where his thumb, his forefinger, and his middle finger were blown off of his dominant right hand, and that he then had to do all these climbing stunts, and he's doing it with a prosthetic glove, it makes your heart beat just watching the movie. And oh. you, you really find yourself pulling for this character to just make it up this building and i think somebody should remake it actually with a modern jim carrey <laughs> <laughs> we both win oh, yeah, <laughs> i think you both win yeah we do <laughs> well the thing about i think they should remake it with tom cruise because tom cruise would actually climb the building he'd take building climbing lessons the news would make a big thing about how he was doing it without a harness and how he could have died and we'd see all these reports and then that would actually add interest and intrigue to then we do an episode condemning tom cruise for being effeminate like we did that climber yeah the cowards climb but hey it works so safety last super recommend it for any kid or any adult who's interested in the construction of comedy it's obviously we're all interested in the construction of comedy right it's really interesting to watch somebody try and construct a gag without being able to rely on dialogue like how do i build in a setup and a payoff and all i've got is visuals and you know looney tunes came along and one upped it all but it's interesting to see them without elastic animated reality try and do this thing it's what i love about buster keaton too hmm. just the ingenuity of you know he had to come up with let's have a wall collapse and i'll stand there and it'll collapse mm-hmm. you know so it's stuff that we take for granted or have seen in montages and but somebody had to come up with it and do it all right number two ben all right number two we're going old school we're going to christmas carol even though I've recently seen the George C. Scott version. It's my favorite. I'm going to, just because, I'm going to put the one that I grew up with, which is Alistair Sims, which is the other best Christmas carol. I think probably the other best Muppets. Christmas carol. A lot of people would be on the side of Alistair Sims over George C. Scott. They yeah. both have their defenders, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think one, one reason I like the idea of putting it on for a kid's movie, though, is because it is black and white, and it's weird. And, like, one thing I that I liked without realizing it as a kid is, like... It, you're watching something that's not like TV or other movies that you watch. It has a strangeness that makes you interested in the story. Uh, Part of this is that we're film nerds and we're talking about the way movies are made. Mm -hmm. And actually, kids get interested in that kind of stuff sometimes without realizing it. This is one of those movies. It is The Christmas Carol. It's a good story. Alistair Sims is awesome as Scrooge. And when he finally turns at the end... It's the best turn of any Scrooge. It's amazing. It's hilarious. It's touching. Stands on his head. He, stands, yeah. he scares the maid. Yeah. It's really wonderful. It makes you Does so happy. Does the little thing with his kid. hair. I'm not crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I may look at, you know. Yeah. One of my favorite moments even as a kid. Oh. I was just like, mm-hmm. I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. And I think it does the best job of any, of any Christmas Carol movie I've seen, uh, which I guess is three, <laughs> of making you feel scrooge's aloneness and like alienation from the world just Mm. like this guy lives in the darkness me george c scott does a good job but sims i think does even better like his life is ugly the waiter he's going to ask the waiter for more bread the waiter's going to say that i'll cost you a little bit of money no more bread and then he'll go home Mm -hmm. alone and anyway i I would say alistair sim is the best probably straight adaptation without muppets of what dickens was doing I prefer George C. Scott because I like George C. Scott's particularly aggressive, masculine malevolence. (laughs) Just the delight that George C. Scott gets out of chewing Mm -hmm. people to pieces is something to behold and just fun. I mean, I've just always loved George C. Scott. You know, he could play Stone Huntington. Behind the uh, paywall, we were talking about uh, on Sanity Villa, 
Sound of Sanity paywall. We were talking about who who could play uh, Stone Huntington in a great, live action. George C. Guy. Scott's about as good as you get with that kind of just alpha. I mean, he played George C. Patton for crying out loud. Yeah. Uh, alpha alpha males don't come much more alpha than George yeah. C. Scott. And he's great in Dr. Strange Love. And so I love, I mean, George C. Scott, if I'd thought of it, I may have been tempted to actually put the George C. Scott Christmas Carol it's, on this list. because That's it's, awesome. It's awesome. It's an awesome movie. Yeah, it's great. I, I think it's the scariest one too. Do but you? maybe that's because I grew up with it. I, I'm not sure if I agree because I haven't seen The Sims for a long time. I just have the memory of how I felt as a kid. And To me, uh, Sims, what's good about Sims, this is all by way of supporting The Sims choice, which is he just plays Scrooge the way I think he would be. He plays him thin and crotchety and mean yeah. and you get some cathartic delight out of George C. Scott dressing down poor innocent people you're like oh I, I wish i could be that awesomely cruel but you don't get that out of alistair sim like he's just a mean old man he's like a ghost and then as you guys both already said alistair sim has the best turn the best of turn. any of them like george yeah. c squad is just too legitimately old and fat to to be to have the boundless energy of right. a redeemed scrooge although i love george c scott's redemption but right uh, sim's redemption is better and sim's is more decrepit yeah. More just like, this guy just wasted away in his soul. But then he's able to turn it around. And, and bring real life. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's really beautiful. Like, it's really wow. cool. Yeah. Those, I think we've mentioned the three, the only three Christmas carols you really need to see. Mm-hmm. Although Mickey's actually <laughs> yeah, Mickey's, is right yeah. up there in my list. And I actually think it's the scariest of all of them. That one I remember. Well, he does fall into hell or something like that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, we've got Bluto or whatever. Yes. You know, why yours, Ebenezer? And he flips off his hood and he lights his cigar, the richest man in the cemetery. And then he knocks him into the, the pit. flames. Yeah. And the flames are, that I was pretty terrifying as a kid. Yeah. In a way that none of the others really were. Yeah, agreed. I mean, they all go for the big scare with Jacob Marley. Nobody thinks to really go for the big scare at the end there. They well, go for pity. They go for a broken Scrooge. Please, spirit, no. Yeah. I, I want to change. I can change. You know. <laughs> I know. That's good. I forgot about that movie. I, I, would, I would still go with your first assessment, though, which is that the big three are do not include that one. That one's great. It's a fun, nostalgic Disney favorite, but it's not one of the big three. <laughs> The big three are Muppets, Scott, and Sim. Not yeah. in that order. So that yeah. was your number two. That was number two. That's my number two. And your number two, Jake? So I had forgotten about the objectionable material of Superman, the movie. Just want to reiterate that. Totoro maybe is objectionable because of its sort of Eastern paganism. My number two is the other one that may have maybe a little objectionable on my list, but it's up there at the top for a reason, and it's E.T., uh, you don't come much better th- 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 for in terms of an iconic classic uh, children's slash family film than E.T. the e. extraterrestrial. The extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't yeah, even I don't even true. know what to say about it. It's just a it's a classic. Yeah, I that mean, great. it is the best boy and his dog movie ever made. Better than any movie with an actual dog. And yeah, Steven Spielberg is a genius. Yeah, it's a exercise in empathy. I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say about it. It's just a great movie. John Williams' best score, probably. Mm-hmm. I mean, how can you even make that determination? But That's pretty you can't. Uh, uh, it's, it's a great score. It's a great yeah. score. One of John Williams' 100 best scores. <laughs> Which uh, is saying something. Yeah, I mean, and even the bad guys aren't bad guys in that movie. Yeah, it's actually gentle, and it, Spielberg doesn't rub his perversity too much in, in your uh, face. Got some language. Iron Giant actually has a, some language too. Unfortunately, oh, I yeah, just remembered I about yeah, that, is, which is dumb. But I, yeah. I wouldn't take either one of them off at your list. So, yeah, no, and and the best, some of the best child acting from the boy that Henry Thomas, who plays Elliot, and Drew Barrymore, Drew Barrymore. Uh, yeah. it's both adorable and uh, wonderful. And yeah, nobody gets it. Nobody gets performances out of kids like Steven Spielberg. Yeah, yeah, wonderful movie. Okay, my number two is a movie. Uh, classic 19, I don't even know exactly when this one was made, either 1930s or 1940s comedy film that was ubiquitous when I was growing up. Like my friend group had all seen this and knew about it, but I don't know how much these, this act is still in the cultural conversation. The Marx Brothers, Night at the Opera is the one that I chose because Mm -hmm. 
it's the favorite of most people. It's actually not my favorite. My favorite would be duck soup or maybe horse feathers because that was the true unleashed, unbridled, anarchic, a little bit more deviant Marx Brothers. That's like the old Marx Brothers. But then they got a contract with Paramount and they said, and the producer came along and said, let's do a love story and have a plot, guys. And people probably like that. And so they made that at the opera, which is has a love story and a plot. And so people love it more than the ones that were just pure Looney Tunes <laughs> goonery. But yeah, I grew up loving the Marx Brothers. Groucho Marx was my hero when I was a kid because he could walk into any situation and it didn't matter how powerful or awesome or important the people were there he could <laughs> deflate them take, down, <laughs> take anybody down a peg he, he could take anybody down a peg <laughs> and uh, man i mean i'm not i'm not the saying power the, of words the power of words yeah i just like locked onto that like what would it be like it, like for like the way that some kids may feel about superman is just like that's that's what i want i want that power to be able to use words the way that he does to just own anyone own any situation like that's just that is the coolest superpower like nobody can get the better of groucho marx even when you get the better of him you don't actually get the better of him because he always is going to get one last little little jab in and you might be important but if you're stupid or you're pompous or you're fat like he'll just tell you that's what you are and he'll get away with it for some reason so i just love that i love the anarchic looney tunes weird energy of harpo running around doing <laughs> weird abstract art or, <laughs> or whatever it is he's doing and uh, you know chico was good too i don't think i quite understood chico as well but <laughs> i probably like him better now just with all his like ethnic he's a stupid italian kind of humor <laughs> i don't think it holds up quite as or it do, doesn't tap into mm. you know it isn't quite as a direct a tap to into my heart as, as groucho was but uh, yeah, I think that every kid should be con- conversant with at least one Marx Brothers films because they're awesome. And th- I think that they're better than the Three Stooges or who I also considered, actually. But mm-hmm. that would just be too s- silly of a choice. Or, I mean, Laurel and Hardy, who's even heard of them anymore? As a kid, I watched some of their movies and never had much fun with them. Yeah, they're not fun. They're not fun. I don't know. Did you guys grow up with the Marx Brothers at all? or just A little. A little bit? Nope. The first yeah. one we saw was The Coconuts. And I was like 10 and it was coconuts is a really dull, slow <laughs> Marx Brothers, like low tier. Yeah. The, the coconut sucks. It's based on a stage play and it's just, it's filmed like a stage, but like they hadn't, yeah. they, they didn't like adapt it for movies, but yeah, no duck soup and a night at the opera are the ones mm-hmm. to watch. And they're both uh, fast and funny and mm-hmm. anarchic and yeah. rebellious and yeah, wonderful. And Hey, if anybody's ever enjoyed, Chip and Lance or any things we've done in, in that vein might, might have taken a little bit of inspiration from the Marx Brothers. I mean, to me, anytime I'm writing a comedy scene, I'm thinking of Groucho and Chico, the party of the first part. There's a famous contract negotiation scene from Night at the Opera that gets more and more ridiculous as it goes and has a nice little verbal build. And just I was just always really fascinated by that you could just put words together and there's not even like punchlines but there's just like words bouncing off of words and for some reason people laugh like it's just like it's the best kind of magic so words are most inexhaustible sort yes, of exactly magic <laughs> as Dumbledore said <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's what's interesting about podcasts right I think I think I, I first latched onto that with the Marx Brothers like these people they just talk and, and there's inexhaustible magic thank you Dumbledore <laughs> so I don't know. You couldn't just have a diet of Marx Brothers because they are anarchic and rebellious. And, you know, you could argue that this is a bad choice, actually, or that this is a a questionable one uh, morally Mm -hmm. because the Marx Brothers hate authority and they hate conventionality and they hate, you know, pomposity. But hey, sometimes the Pharisees just have to be taken down. I don't know. Is that that too uh, wrapping myself too much in the flag of the Bible there? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, Love Night at the Opera. It's the best. Marx Brothers rule. That's my number two pick. And that brings us to number one, Ben. Number one. I'm Harry Potter gonna... and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> Return to Oz again. <laughs> Although, you know, that is funny. I didn't even Star think Wars, of- Star uh, Wars, A New Hope. I didn't even think of Prisoner of Azkaban, which I love. Uh, I think it's a fun kids movie. But 
No Harry Potter on my list. No, I'm just going for something that Jake said. Ah, I didn't think I should put that on my list. It's a Wonderful Life. I grew up watching that every Christmas. And, and though I can remember, I, I still feel this way sometimes. I don't want to watch It's a Wonderful Life again. I always get totally into it when I actually watch it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true. I loved it as a kid. I didn't understand everything, every scene as a kid. But it it worked for me from a pretty young age to just get caught up in the life of this little town and this guy and his childhood and his growing up and his dreams and some things connected with me more and some were funnier like Clarence, I guess, and, you know, the weird world without George Bailey that you spend the whole movie waiting for. I think I remember that as a kid. But every time I watch, every year I watched it, I would like it more and more. So at some age, I think it's a good kids movie that grows with your kids. And that's a pretty fun trait for a movie to have. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if Jake's kids have watched this with him. Yeah. They have. Yeah. I don't know how much they like it. I'd be curious. I'm guessing nobody's begging for it. Yeah, nobody's asking Mm -hmm. for it. Nobody's excited for it, but they'll sit and watch it. It's one of those movies that, you know, I just insist that my kids have Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a part of their lives because it's one of the, one of my probably top five best movies of all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, for me too. Me three. There you go. I didn't put it on my list, but yeah, it's, it's awesome. I mean, and I remember, I do remember having a similar experience to you of watching it as a kid, actually in, sort of enjoying and being intrigued by the fact that it was beyond me, all their adult problems, Mary losing her robe, if I'm being honest, things like that, that just mm-hmm. felt sort of, it's weird because we think of it as such an innocent little classic movie, <laughs> yeah, but <it's> got some... <laughs> yeah, for me as a kid, it was like, what is this weird, dark adult world of, of angels, of sex, of you know, there's like a lot of banking problems. Like, yeah. Well, as as a little boy who had a lot of crushes, I <laughs> resonated with like the, the love story. So, yeah. George yeah. Bailey being in love with with Mary and Mary waiting for that to work every, out. Every little boy's fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, we talk about this in our. We, yeah, we we, we talked at length about this, but. It's a great movie. The only reason I didn't put it on my list is because I was just afraid. And I don't know why I wasn't afraid of this with all my other things on my list. But I was just like, I don't know that that really actually plays for kids. But like you were saying, it played for me when I was a kid, basically. Swing time, however. Yeah, swing time, obviously. <laughs> uh, there's many different silent movies and yeah, old forms of comedy that they're not familiar with. The kids love that stuff, obviously. But it's a wonderful life uh, over their heads. Yeah, no, wonderful you know, if kids don't like it, they should just be forced. I would say that of all the movies on my list, but it's wonderful life. No one can argue against me. Maybe with some of the other ones, they can. Jake, your number one pick, I have a feeling it might be the same as mine. The only movie that's practically perfect in every way. Yes, indeed. Mary Poppins. And I called it 28. Yep. Total list. Our lists diverged except for two titles. Good job. Mary Poppins is, yeah, it's great. What do you want to say about it? I don't know what there is to say about it. It does all of the things. It's the, it's the movie that you can grow up with, like It's a Wonderful Life, like an American Tale, where your perspective changes from the kids to George. It's got a a lot of magic that never goes away. It's mm-hmm. Julie Andrews at her best and most magical. It's just special. Mm-hmm. And women can learn to just stop nagging and stop uh, trying to get their rights and help make a kite yeah so take take that uh women's suffrage movement yeah take that harder and turn it into a kite tail yeah no it's a perfect movie it's you know i I love the you know fly trapped in amber quality of certain movies you know the fact that julie andrews was never going to be that young again or that old again or that perfect for the role again and we just you know there's this perfect little lightning in a bottle nexus of time and we, we we captured her and She's there forever now, even after the real Julie Andrews passes on. It's it's the cool science fiction aspect of what movies give us. That performance will live forever. Dick Van Dyke, same thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think I really resonate with what you said about the way that the locus of meaning has shifted. You know, if you'd 
if you'd said, hey, remember Mary Poppins? When I was a kid, I would have pictured penguin waiters. Right. Now you say, remember Mary Poppins? And I picture a sad, broken man walking, walking to the bank, walking to a bank under the night sky with the London fog, you know, beautiful, melancholy, existential. And, you know, my, my daughter is three weeks old. I just bet if I watch that movie again in 10 years, uh, it'll mean something completely different. Probably it'll mean the crushing weight of being a completely failed father who's thrown away more pictures of, you know, instead of hung, hanging them on the fridge and all that kind of crap. And yep. time has sl- slipped like a all the little dandelions that you didn't appreciate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, but it's a perfect musical. Uh, I mean, I've, I've said before, and I may say again, it's, it might be my favorite movie. I think it's what it does. It does perfectly. And my favorite movie has to be a Hollywood movie w- with all the machinery of Hollywood and of special effects and stuff. Because what's the point of liking movies if you're just kind of like a stage play that's been mm-hmm. filmed? Even if it's a stage play that's been filmed that's as wonderful as Casablanca, I still think there's something better about a movie that does what only movies can do. So that means my favorite movie has to be a Citizen Kane or... Mm-hmm. But Citizen Kane is just not that likable. So, of course, it's got to be Mary Poppins. Uh, unless it's about, you know, it's Raiders of the Lost Ark. But I think it's Mary Poppins because that one's more wholesome. So. For your favorite movie ever? Yeah, I, I yeah. think so. Yeah, just... Huh. It's the best. I mean, it's a perfect movie. So, yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful life. Be close. Mm. Yep. I think we have at least... Three or four of the same movies in our top five. Mary Poppins, Wonderful Life, Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Order, and what else rounds out that top five may be different. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> yeah. My, I, that's, that's Jake's favorite that's movies. My, my number one, right? obviously. Yeah. But. I, I'm not just trying to be a contrarian, but I don't think Mary Poppins is in my top five. I'm probably unjust, but I just don't care. Like, I like it okay. That's how I feel. I am I can agree it's a masterpiece. And... And all that, but I like, I, I enjoy Citizen Kane I don't Kane think it more. would be, I don't think it would be in my top five if I wasn't a dad. Hmm. I, I don't think that I would, if I were in Nathan's shoes, I don't know that it, when I, when I was in Nathan's shoes, I don't think it would have ranked up there. Yeah, the it, it, did, it did for me. Well, you know, Ben, it's okay not to have a heart, you know, <laughs> you don't, you don't need one. It's okay. Good. And I've souls completely with, overrated. Uh, I've lived this long with that one, Nathan. Yeah. It'd be hard to know that I'd lived in vain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. You could just go through life, you know, with a dead-eyed sort of zombie. Uh, watch, watch Willow on reruns. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's one does. No, I can. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to criticize you for, for not having Mary Poppins hit. If it doesn't hit, it doesn't hit. I don't know. It may hit someday. It may hit someday. I yeah. like a lot of Well, that. also, I, like Mary I can see how maybe... It could slide into a position of not hitting just by, you know, you grow up with it. You take it for granted and. Which I did. Yeah. You have to have, you have to have a beautiful moment of rediscovery with something like that. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't had it, then it's just the fun movie that you grew up with that you take for granted. Yeah. Um, Yeah, That's all. That's all I was trying to say. Yeah. And Jake. Hadn't I, had I not sat down one night with my kids and popped it on and rediscovered it and rediscovered Mm -hmm. that it meant way more to me than I ever thought it could then it would have just been one of those movies. Hmm. Yeah, and I had a similar moment where I think I was looking at it from the kid's point of view, but just the, all, all the dad stuff suddenly really hit. Mm. Uh, I think sometime in my 20s after I'd kind of closed the book on one chapter with my dad and everything. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know why it hit the way it did, but I just turned it on for some reason. Uh, I think like maybe a new DVD or Blu-ray set or something had come out. Like, oh, yeah, this is a classic. I should watch it again to see what's up with that. And then it just really hit for me. So anyway, there you go. Any, uh, Jake, you want to just read off any, anything you think deserves to... <clears throat> I'll just run through the things that I had written down. It's Wonderful Life was m- my first runner-up. The Incredibles, both Cinderella movies, both the animated mm. and the live-action one. Mm. Babe? I forgot about Babe. I had Babe on my list. It, it was a narrow runner. It was like 11 or 12. Yeah, so Babe's in my top 15. Mm-hmm. Beauty and the Beast, the Toy Story saga. Spider-Man 2, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, The Land Before Time, The Lion King, Ratatouille, The Lego Movie, Kubo and the Two Strings, Inside Out, How to Train Your Dragon, The Fantastic Mr. Fox, Big Hero 6, The Paddington Franchise, Wreck-It Ralph, Robin Hood, The Animated Classic, 
Super Band 2 and the Adventures. What is this uh, Robin Hood animated classic? I don't think I've heard about it. In the Adventures of Tintin. Somebody somebody make a Robin Hood animated classic? <laughs> <clears throat> I know that Disney Robin Hood movie. I wouldn't, I don't think, no, it's not really, not really a classic because it's animated. Uh, <clears throat> So, do you consider the Russell Crowe Robin Hood to be, an- <laughs> to be animated in the classic? So, it, that was my list of just movies that you could turn on and be happy about turning on. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you which which one I want to highlight on that list is the Kenneth Branagh Cinderella. We've talked about it a million times before, but I love that movie. It's I think it's, it's just great. It's really just like it just does the story and it's really sweet and it doesn't yeah. feel the need to do a bunch of feminist stuff. But it's not just what it doesn't do; it's what it does do, which is tell a terrific version of the Cinderella story. Like that movie makes me cry. Yeah. I was amazed when I saw it. Yeah. yeah. That, it, really that it was that. <laughs> yeah. And that Lily James talk about capturing the right performer at the right time. She was like magic for that, for that role. Okay. Anything else you want to throw on the fire of movies that Lyle should watch on his solar powered DVD player, Ben? Sure. I mean, I already said the Incredibles was a runover of mine. Absolutely. How to train your dragon. As I recall is actually pretty great. It mm-hmm. is. Sequels, not so much, but the first one? Yep. I just saw mine. Too. Did you did you say How to Train Your Dragon? Did I, I miss did. It? I ran through it. Sorry. Yeah. I just missed it. The Secret World of Arietti. That is an anime adaptation of The Borrowers. It's very kid-friendly and sweet and fun. And it's about, you know, little borrower people in a big person world living yes. like with thimbles and tiny crumbs of bread that to them are like giant low mountains. I can vouch for that. It's quite good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I really wish, Spirited Away, I mean, maybe it's no worse than putting The Good Dinosaur on here, but Spirited Away, for older kids, if you think they should see it, is a great kids movie, potentially. Yeah. Uh, Great Muppet Caper, I mentioned. Muppet Christmas Carol has already been on a list. Yep. I had the Toy Story saga on here. I just put Toy Story 3. I think that was the one I remembered liking the most, but Toy Story 2 probably is the best. Star Wars saga, Sword in the Stone. I loved that one growing up. Is there anything objectionable about that? Mad, 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 a mim. It's like, of, so. it's like of quality. I mean, it's, it's, it, <laughs> it's a bad movie. We, I loved it too. Squirrel uh, romance. But it's, it's, squirrel it's, romance. <laughs> it's not, it's not a movie that really holds up very well. And when I say that, I what I mean is that. they, they like recast Wart three times. You can hear three. If you, like, as you watch it as an adult, oh, the yeah. seams just really show, but it was, a, I, I, that was like I would have said that was my favorite Disney movie when I was. It was one of mine you know, as a kid. I liked it a lot. Eight or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I haven't seen it since I was a kid. So. Yeah. All right. Take that. Take that for what it's worth. Sound of Music, Beauty and the Beast. They're down. They're on here too. There's there's a random stuff that I wonder if as a, as a kid of a certain age who was raised watching It's a Wonderful Life, I might have liked like the shop around the corner. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, that might just that might didn't be quite too have enough adult. for a kid. Uh, yeah. There's yeah. not there's not like a Clarence or anything supernatural or slapstick. Which no, is, uh, not really. So, yep. Anything else on your list? Not really. I thought about putting Babe on there. I wish I'd thought about putting the Lily James Cinderella on there because that yeah, would have been something a, a little pull. bit fresher and more modern that I could put on. Babe Pig in the City, if you want to... <laughs> after they've watched The Good Dinosaur that, and yeah. after they've digested Spirited Away. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, that's, uh, that one belongs on my list, I guess. Yeah, no. Yeah, I Sean, found Sean off- the Sheep could go on there. I found it's it pretty good. off-putting as a kid. Yeah, like, I don't know. that it's, 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 in the city. it's an interesting adult movie, maybe. I really loved the Wallace and Gromit shorts mm. uh, growing up. Don't love the feature-length Curse of the Were-Rabbit movie quite as much, but uh, Wallace and Gromit rule. If people aren't familiar with those movies, I suggest that they check them out. I loved Sean the Sheep, the movie. Yeah, I saw that once. It just just occurred to me, popped into my head when he said "Babe Pig in the City." There was there's literally one image. I don't know, in that animals movie. and cities, and Shaun the Sheep popped in my head. I like that movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, fun slapstick. There was one image in it that was gross. I don't remember that. It probably would just go past most kids, but it was a note. I don't know. It's worth noting. There you go. Well, yeah. there'll be one image. It'll go past your kids, or maybe it won't. Um. Trying to think if there's anything else that I would want to throw on there. The complete Muppet saga, obviously. I mean, most of the stuff that I didn't put on there was just like Beauty and the Beast, obviously, the 92 yeah. version. None of us said Aladdin, right? No. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't. I'm famously 
Aladdin detractor or whatever, even though I like it just fine. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't quite make the cut of like the greatest whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I got nothing else. I think I wrote some other things down, but I deleted them and I don't remember them now. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. There you go. Inside Out was on my list. Sorry, Jake, I wasn't paying any attention to your list. That's not true. I was, but. Uh, If I thought that it was a good idea, my heart wants to put Coco on there as far as Pixar goes. I wanted to put Coco on here too, but I didn't. We're talking about unobjectionable. Yes. And. Coco crosses a line that even the BT with its language and doesn't. Yeah, there's just something gross about corpse people in the yep. Mexican netherworld or whatever. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Although I put Kubo in the two strings on here. So. <laughs> yeah. Don't know why I felt okay doing that while I left Coco off. But. I'm sure they'd be throwing <laughs> Caroline on here as long as we're uh, coming up with a list of traumatized <laughs> kids. Coraline. Oh, man. I just really liked Kubo. I still need to see it. I have actually never watched the whole thing, but I watched part of it and was like, this is awesome. And then I just never came back to it for some reason. But yeah, huh. it's all, I can verify it. it is awesome. Well, we're we're going to be able to see each other's lists under this post, right? So we can we can all go and pick things that we might want to see, haven't seen. Yeah, yeah. You guys send me your lists right now and I'll, yeah. I'll put them on the final okay. posts so people right. can just see the 30 I, I, or I'm 28. Cha- um, I, I'm changing the order of my list. <laughs> I don't, I don't think you can do that, Ben. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a cheater, that's all. Yeah. All right. Anything final that people want to throw in there? I watched The Brave Little Toaster a lot as a kid, but <laughs> I do not recommend that one. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. Goodbye, folks. Oh, guys, we almost forgot. We almost forgot to oh, no. do the Patron Choice Award of Awesomeness. We chose 28 films. Now let's choose one patron and talk about how awesome they are. So I think I did Seth last time. I got to get a better, maybe I did Ryan and Judith last time. I don't know. Let's talk about Jeffrey. How awesome is Jeffrey, guys? If you could compare Jeffrey to one movie on this list, Uh, what what movie would you compare it to? Wreck It, Ralph, because Jeffrey, you're wrecking it. I mean, in a good way, Mm -hmm. a positive way. I would compare him to a night on the opera or at the opera because he's got more class than uh-huh. two tickets to the Metropolitan Opera. Wow. Jake, what movie would you compare Jeffrey to? The Iron Giant. Because is he a monster or is he Superman? I think he's Superman. Yeah, I think he is too. Sleeping Beauty. Jeffrey looks great when he sleeps. <laughs> and I was also <laughs> compare him to that. There's all kinds of movies. Uh, wow. Listen. Jeffrey, you're great. You're a patron. We love you. If other people would like to be part of the Patron Choice Award of Awesomeness, go to patreon.com forward slash sanity at the movies. Make the appropriate contribution on a monthly basis, and we will add you to the Patron Choice Award of Awesomeness list, the PCAA, not the Presbyterian Church of America, the Patron Choice Award of Awesomeness. All right. Until next time. Jake, you got to say a line from each of these 28 (laughs) movies. Well, first of all, I'd like to make one thing clear. Yes. I never explained anything. You never explained anything? I never explained anything. I don't know what movie that's from. Even I know what movie that's from. It's from Mary Poppins. It is, yeah. Okay, I figured it was. (laughs) (laughs) That was a pretty great pull. That was a good pull. (sighs) All right. Goodbye, folks. 